Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, Advanced Audio Mixing Techniques with Ken Pooch Van Druten and Chris Rabel. My name is Michael Grandinetti and I'm a content marketing coordinator here at Harmon. A few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit questions to the presenters and they will try to answer as many, at the, at many as possible at the end. This webinar will also be recorded and the link will be made available a few days after the presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we encourage you to take a look at those webinars in our learning sessions workshop series on pro.harman.com, as well as by visiting Harman Professional Training to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'm gonna pass it to Harman's very own Raul Gonzalez to introduce the presenters and get things started. Take it away, Raul. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our guests from all over the world. Today, we have a super special Harman session for you with two of the most iconic Forno House engineers in the business today. I'd like to first introduce a guy that requires no introduction. He's been with us before. An experienced producer, graduate of the Berkeley College of Music, more Pernelli and Tourling Top Awards than anybody should ever win. Grammy nominated, his work with bands like Lincoln Park, Kiss, Jay Z, Travis Scott, Guns N' Roses. Please welcome Iron Maiden's front house engineer, your friend and my friend, Kenneth Pooch Van Druten. Say hello, Pooch. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you. Appreciate you joining us. It's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. A lot of fun with this second guest. I've been chasing this young man for a long time. He is a fan of Tim Ballas and Congas on Widespread Panic, a <laughs> graduate of Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro. He has been mixing all the bands that win all the Grammys. Kenny Chesney, Alicia Keys, you know, Florence and the Machine, Bruno Mars, Lady Gaga. That's why that Lady Gaga national anthem sounded so good. Please welcome, for the first time to our Harman session, the one and only Chris Raybould. Say hello, what Chris. What is going on, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you are both doing well. Uh, for those of you joining us from other warm countries, please be aware that we are going through some apocalyptic cold weather in the Midwest. So we're very happy to be able to have Pooch here today, uh, frozen Texas. So we got the uh, squirrels on the generator back here generating some uh, AC so that I can be <laughs> right. there. You go. Yeah. Uh, for those of you, I'm sure that everybody here knows, but I have to start by saying this. First of all, the title of the session: Advanced Audio Mixing Techniques. So there are some things that will be advanced, like the title says. Um, number two. All of the topics we're going to cover today can be analyzed in depth on Pooch and Rabel's podcast or Pooch and Rabel's YouTube channel. If you haven't been following this, you need to start tonight. You got 43 hours to go listen starting tonight. Put it on your calendar. Um, and same thing with the podcast. Those can be found on your favorite podcast platform. And uh, so... That is that for announcements. I want to figure out how to stop sharing. This will be a conversatorium. We're going to converse, no PowerPoint. And so I encourage you to set up your computer on gallery view, and uh, if you prefer, so you can see all three of us. So thank you guys for coming. I hope you're both doing well and staying healthy. And uh, let's just jump into it. Today's session is going to be uh, longer than our typical one hour session because it is just impossible to talk to these two guys for just one hour. Um, we talk a lot. We love to chat. <laughs> um, I'm a huge fan of education. Uh, this Harman series uh, emphasizes continuing education. So I love to to hear your take. You you, you know, put you went to Berkeley, uh, Rabel, you went to MTSU. I love to tell me a little bit of that time and how that impacted or helped kind of shape uh, the career that you have had over the last 25 years. Chris, you want to take that? Yeah, I'll take that. <clears throat> um, you know, I think for me, I don't think for me, I know for me, the big thing about, you know, where I went to school at MTSU, they have the oldest four-year program in the nation. 
it's, it's an actual degree. It's not a certificate, and the certificate programs are great. But that meant something to me, and it meant something to my folks. Um, that it was an actual college degree, but it was not. It was 100% studio focused. I think at the time now they have some more sound reinforcement. Maybe there's a whole thing now. I'm not even sure. sure. But um, for me, it was getting the theory mm -hmm. so that when I went, as I was learning, you know, and gigging and working in clubs and bars and frats and all these other places that you start out, when I went to go do something, I at least kind of sort of knew the why of, of, of why it was happening. You yeah. know what I mean? And uh, just the other day, I had a, a seven-year-old Someone has a seven-year-old that has decided he wants to be a sound engineer. How cool awesome. is that? Perfect. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, and he just came up with it on his own. So we had this cute little Zoom call, and um, and he asked if I went to school, and I and I told him yes, and I didn't do it just because I think his parents probably wanted that answer, right. but because I really did find it invaluable to me to get the theory. Of course, there's plenty of hands-on in, in school as well. Right. But the theory is really what stuck with with me, and is what I've i right. took from that experience the most great yeah i mean you know absolutely i agree that um if anybody ever asked me should i go to an audio school the answer is always yes and here's why it's a place to fail <laughs> it's a place to go and be like oh i'm gonna put you know uh, whatever microphone in front of uh, this guitar amp and see what it does when you do that in the real world, there's clients and there's money involved and there's, you know, all these kind of things. So I had four years at Berkeley to beg, borrow and steal studio time. And at three in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, put, uh, um, you know, whatever in front of a guitar amp and be like, oh, OK, I like that, but let's move it over here. And I spent yeah. hours doing that. So it's experimentation and it's the theory that Raybold was talking about that yeah. I think you can't get just anywhere else. So if you have that opportunity, I highly recommend you go to school. Yeah, absolutely. The opportunity to, you know, be broke during college and be broke right after college. So you can take every, every <laughs> and be gig, broke. Yes. <laughs> practice every gig and figure out which way to point your 414s, you know, <laughs> things like that. Um, you know, as Silver your side, career, yeah. right? <laughs> as your career has been, you know, moving, you know, up and up and up, you know, over the last 25 years, how have you, how do you continue learning because you guys are at the sort of the top edge of technology so how do you find the time how do you allocate time to continue learning something a new console a new plug-in a new microphone do you isolate time to do something like that i think for me it has become a series of habits mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what i mean by that just like you might habitually pick up your phone to read the news mm -hmm. um you know, I will habitually pick up my phone or look at the computer and it's not as intense as it used to be. I'll, I'll admit that, you know, but it is a, a cursory glance mm -hmm. at the industry news or product products that have been released or now with social media, you know, I don't even have to try. I'm just inundated. If anything, I'm overwhelmed. Yeah. And, fe and now I feel again the need to really get up on it um with with what all's coming out you mm -hmm. know and if i see something that looks like it's got some traction and i see it enough then i'll delve into it and yeah. i'll and, and i'll start to learn it i have chosen not to, purposely not to overwhelm myself you know we get to the point where you don't want to be you don't want to be the guy that is always dependent on a hundred assistants mm -hmm. but I know what I do well, and I mix music well. You know what I mean? Yes. I do technology okay. Mm -hmm, I used to mm -hmm. I used to do technology really well. When I was sure. coming up, I mean I teched everything and uh, knew it and and did it all. Now I know I know I want to learn what that plugin is and I want to mm -hmm. learn what it does. Mm -hmm. When we start getting into some of these other areas yeah. uh, that are more technology specific, and I'm talking about like networking. In yeah. some of these things where our industry clearly you better see where it's not that it's going it's already there it's absolutely. gone absolutely it's gone you know and i just did a gig this past week and i've never heard and i've done gigs a little bit during covid and i mean i must have heard the word dante seven thousand yeah. <laughs> times right it's like it's it's yeah. game over you know it it's it's where yeah, it is yeah. or some networking protocol someone's going avb or they're naming some something else so yeah. anyway the the point is 
you just make it a habit to stay aware. And then the things that you're really interested in, which for me are mixing things. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be plugins or, or gear or microphones or something like that, or speaker technology. Those are the things that I really make a point. I don't even make yeah. a point. I just can't help but to stay up on now. It's just habit. Yeah. And I know, Pooch, that, you know, you also, you know, spend a lot of time working in the studio and that was a lot of time for you to sort of to to, to allocate time and apprentice on all kinds of techniques from, you know, microphone techniques, you know, one of the topics we're going to talk about. Uh, I do. Yeah, I just want to touch on that a little bit, too, is that, you know, stay in touch with your peers. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, where I learn about new shit is talking to other guys that are mixing at my level. You know, I talk to Toby mm -hmm. Francis on a regular basis. And mm -hmm. every time I talk to that guy, he's always like, hey, have you tried the, you know, right. blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no. OK, I'll go check it out. You <laughs> check know? that out. Yeah. Um, you know, every time I talk to Cookie, you know, yeah. he's always like, have you tried this plugin? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I'll yeah, go check yeah. it out. So I get driven by my relationships, you know what yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. to stay up on whatever the hippest shit is and and it um, is the function of staying up on top of your game right when yeah you, when you might choose to go more technical you might choose more creative and then you go okay what do i have to do to continue improving on that and that's yeah. part of your continued uh, learning approach um you know uh, sort of going to mix some of the events that you guys are mixing at the, at the stratosphere stratospheric level that you're at you know, you come to battle with some specific tools, you know, uh, and I, you know, we could go through a lot of them, but I'm, I'm just going to limit this to just three particular kinds of tools, uh, microphones, uh, your mixing console, and a couple of extra things for processing, right? There's some, some of the tools of your battle, right? You're going to deliver this m massive sound. Um, I'm curious, Rabel, Everybody, for example, wants to know, well, what color is the Mojave mic that you were using on those drums? And, mm -hmm. and that, so I was telling Pooch, I'm more interested in your thoughts as to how, when you were coming up, how did you decide or how did you learn about when to use a condenser mic versus a dynamic mic versus a ribbon mic? Not just a particular brand of mic, but right. the type of transduction. <clears throat> right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um... First of all, you know, a lot of what Pooch mentioned was early on, it's, you know, in, in school, I had the opportunity to, it, it, my, my, I look back on school and I mean, I just, you just do everything wrong. You just don't know, you <laughs> know, right. It's the and, place um, to fail. Yeah. Did you yeah and there, like with, no, with no consequences. Now, conversely, right. if you're the sound guy at the bar, don't, you can't yeah. even call it a music club. It's a bar, bar. that has a PA. The, you know, the, the stakes are pretty low and you can <laughs> screw up there too. So <laughs> right. there was a lot of, there was a lot of, uh, proving grounds as I came up and I made, and, and I say the same thing, you know, it's like, you will learn far more from screwing up mm -hmm. than you will from your successes. So, but I can tell you, as you were talking, the main thing that really stuck in my head once I, and I was fortunate in my, in my early twenties, about 24. I got to the point to where I could spec rigs through a sound company, you know? Um, I mean, for years, my input list changed on the regular, mm -hmm. just and now it's like, I don't even have to think about it. I know exactly what I'm putting down. It, mm -hmm. I might do something different or try something new or go back to something old, but for years, if it was a microphone line and a manufacturer made it, I tried it on okay. every single source. Oh, okay. You know? So, I mean, I, I think that I, I'm just thinking of all the different things that have made it on toms, that made it on guitar cabinets, that were different mm -hmm. mic, vocal mics, that were different overhead. I mean, I just literally took advantage of those situations and I have specced everything that finds itself on a live stage often, mm -hmm. you right. know? Um, no, you can't no, overstate what he just said, Raul. Well, yes, you know, so here's, here's, the, here's the thing everybody always talks about plugins and consoles and you yes. know, all that kind of stuff. Yes. But the real deal is, is you should be experimenting with microphones. It's yes. the first acoustic to electric transduction guys. And those are where you should be experimenting. Yeah, ding, 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 right? It's like a situation where you and I have been there going, I'm glad you have these four plugins here. Perhaps if you try this one mic, you can get away with just one. 
mm -hmm. or you know do you have the right transduction mechanism to capture that finesse or the transient of that you know you and i were talking yesterday i said oh well you know holy iglesias akg 535s we used that for ages probably wouldn't give that to you know uh, bruce on iron maiden right so it's right. just that kind of situation uh so yeah, i think it's important that to our audience to actually uh burning the time to actually understand you know what kind of microphone technology transduction is appropriate for for the situation but it I needs like to be in your toolkit just yes. as plugins are in your toolkit right mm -hmm. you say yeah. oh yeah i know that's this is something that needs a c6 Absolutely. in that same way you need to be have in your toolkit the you know this I, is why i use a 414 here or, i like what know. rabel said about the ability to say look i put different mics in front of the same source and yeah. just to see how that worked for you and going, wow, oh, that's not, that's not you. That's, that, that's just crapping out or it's clipping or it doesn't have the high frequency I want, you mm -hmm. know, and you went through that process empirically and just goes into your bag of tricks. So that's, you know, that's I, um, cool. it's great. You know, it's just funny that it's, I mentioned I had a gig last week <clears throat> and at that gig, I won't mention what the microphone was. There was a Leslie that was going to be involved. And, um, and I asked them to, for to a certain microphone. And the guy asked me, he's like, he's like, oh, you like those? And I was like, no, I actually hate them. <laughs> I said, they're really, I was like, they're really dull. And that's why I put them on Leslie's is there they help de-shrill. Yeah, sure. They soften the inherently ice pick sat tonality of, so do you see what I'm saying? So it's yes, like, absolutely. I even, I even found mics that I didn't like that I went, ooh, I know where I can use that. And I now you, and you know, vice versa. So, you, you know, the and, same and, thing and this can, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Rahul. Um, go ahead. Th this continues in your, as your career is building, like I, you have to be ballsy. I'm ballsy <laughs> in that I have an input that sounds amazing. And I take that mic away and put something else there sometimes <laughs> because somebody said to me, Hey, you should try that on guitars. I went, right. Okay, I'm gonna yeah. try it on the guitar. You know yeah. what I mean? So you have to have enough passion to want to continue your experience to learn whatever the newest stuff is. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, same thing applies to the you know making sure you know all the patterns on when you want to use a cardio or you want to use you know yeah. a very tight pattern or you know are you gonna try to capture something with a figure eight or whatever? Are you recording? Are you not recording? That comes uh, uh, to be of a valuable piece of information. And obviously, also c considering some of the monitor engineers that you guys you know big shout out to Tater, big shout out to Ramon Morales. Uh, you know those two super monitor engineers. There's a collaboration there when you go. Is this the right mic for the application? Well, I was getting ready to say something too because. You know, you mentioned the studio earlier. In the studio, I'm not saying there's not a host of personalities you have to deal with, but it's typically mm -hmm. far more pared down than what we deal with on the road. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's the band, it's the engineer, it's the producer, and then you might have some other assortment of people. Once you get into live sound, you know, there's there's two engineers. Uh, there's a tech, there's the player, there's all these different people, and everyone has, is some degree closer Right. to the artist ear and to the you never quite know who's doing what and for instance you know we're talking about this and you mentioned the relationship with monitor engineers mm -hmm. one of the things that i know to do too is i will always if it's like a, a real quote unquote gig and we can have multiple mics on single sources input mm -hmm. one of guitar for me is always an sm57 and that is because I know yep. what I can do with an SM57. Yes. I also know every monitor guy on earth is not <laughs> going to roll his eyes at, right, Pooch? They're yes. not like, they're going to accept it. Yes. Every artist is going to look over there and go, okay, I know that. Like, as <laughs> soon as you only yes. have esoteric mic, like, that's just as someone's easy. Right easy way of of bitching about something so there's not only do i know and i do i like 57s they work yeah but 57 goes one and then something cool goes on the second and i might <laughs> yeah, blend them sure. or i might only use the second so it's not sure. only for its technical application it's for its political application as well absolutely it brings up a comfort of uh, appreciation and, and and calms everybody down going we're good this is it okay does. as opposed to putting a very fancy ribbon mic there we go what is that right thing? 
Right. Absolutely. No, I, I love that idea. And I think it's important that, that people keep experimenting because, you know, microphone technology, you know, you guys are using some very cool mics, you know, that maybe, you know, 10 years ago, nobody would have thought of taking that on the road. So that's kind of a cool thing nowadays. You know, um, the other thing, yeah. Raul, uh, sorry to interrupt you. The other thing, Raul, the other that you brought up was about microphone patterns and how mm. important that is and how that affects the monitor engineer affects yeah. them more than it affects you yeah. in some ways, especially when we're talking about the loudest input in your mix, the vocal microphone. If you are choosing a vocal microphone that has a super tight pattern, super cardioid or whatever, you might be boning the monitor guy by turning yeah. that into the lightsaber of sound, mm -hmm. right? Yes, absolutely. Um, so <laughs> those are conversations yeah. and you may be able to make a compromise and say, okay, well, let's use the cardioid capsule yep. so that you aren't gonna get yelled at because those guys all have things in their ears that are connected directly to their ears, you know? Yeah, and, and you are. have to be a little bit of the Henry Kissinger of you know peace. So everybody kind of, you know, it's happy and going, you, I can deal with this, you can deal with that, everybody's happy. You yeah, know, so we, it's it's something as a front of house guy, you need to take into account, just like what Chris said, there's other people involved, it's not just you. Yeah, the other most important tool in your arsenal that you, to deliver the kind of shows that you're working with is your mixing platform. And we're gonna, all of you guys, uh, both of you guys and your monitor partners, uh, I'm working on, on Digico SD7s, so a huge uh, shout out to our friend, Matt Larson. Hope you're doing well in Minneapolis, not freezing <laughs> off. Best salesman um, of all time, the, Matt Larson. The man. I look forward to seeing you at Summerfest, buddy. Um, and so, you know, not just to talk about uh, the SD7, I'm more interested in the fact that at the level that you are mixing, uh, the platform that you mix on has a list of requirements that is pretty staggering in the sense that, and I'd love you to try to shame on this because uh, like, let's say for example, a Bruno Mars show, Chris, how many inputs fader wise did you land on that? <clears throat> uh, as far as inputs off the list, let me give you that. That might be easier. Yeah. Um, I think we ended up with like 120 for some reason, 127 comes to mind. I don't know. 120, no. a, a bunch. A lot. That's a lot. landed it inputs is. from the stage, right? That like, is that's, from that. That is right. Yes. That's yeah. a lot, right? That and you, right. you know, you're landing 64 on Maiden, and by the time you add effects, you're basically into the hundred. You know. Yeah, Jay Z so, was something yeah. like 135 or something total. So yeah. that right there kind of separates some consoles from others, right? You go, okay, this yeah. one or this one or that one, and all of a sudden there's not that many that will get there, let alone sonic quality on the preamp, right? Probably very. Is that a, a very important factor for you, or are you just taking everything in digital nowadays? You still the preamp is important to you. Oh, I mean, for me, it's it's what it's all about. And it's part of the reason that I use Digico specifically sure. is because their preamps are are so transparent. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like they're, you know, with the new 32-bit cards, there is some coloration now, which is actually yeah. coloration that I like. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But but believe it or not, I keep some of the old school cards in, um, in stage sure. racks for things that I want to be super transparent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's one of the reasons that I chose that because some other platforms, some other manufacturers have very colored front end. Sure. Um, and that's cool. And that, you know, people enjoy that and they, you know, whatever, but from my point of view, it gives me a blanker slate. I don't know. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, totally. <clears throat> um, it's that it's specifically for Digico, um, the lack of color traditionally. Mm -hmm traditionally yeah. is what's made it the ultimate palette because yeah. it's the smoothest blankest palette and you get to choose whichever way you want to go um in fact here recently pooch and i've got a, this project we're working on together where we're you know we actually need audio to show to people and um i was sourcing <laughs> well, two like, that's a good instead, of, in, instead of us just talking about it which we that's now so weird which is weird we now do this very well uh, yes. um, in, in theory we know how to mix and so yeah. um i don't know though it's been i year don't now. either i'm yeah. making no promises um so uh but anyway i was sourcing tracks and i was really trying hard to get stuff from mm. a digico for that reason because i knew and i'm just going to go ahead and say it here 
if it wasn't for this one particular act, if I wasn't getting Digico tracks of the ones I was willing to look at from this particular era, it was going to be older, hear me say older, avid <laughs> mm -hmm. tracks. Yeah. And I yeah. know the coloration that comes with those. And mm -hmm. I thought to myself, God, if I get, it's fine. They're going to be clean. It's going to be clean audio, but it's going to have that sound. I really wish I could just have the cleaner mm -hmm. Digico sound, you know. And now, like Pooch has said, and Pooch has way more miles on the 32-bit cards than I do, but I've now have a little bit. Yeah. Um, we just were reticent to, we, we, we wouldn't update the Bruno rig forever because we never stopped. Yeah. I mean, it was just, a long we, you go from tour, tour. We, you yeah. go from tour into like you know a wedding band once a month, and I'm like, when are we going to stop and redo it? <laughs> so, Bob, anyway, <laughs> it's true, it's true. That's oh, how he man. rolls. I mean, our rig has been put together since 2016. Wow, well, you know, yeah. So, which, uh, which but is here, good. And it speaks to the fact that it's also reliable and visionary. You know, that too important. You know, that too. It's, it's, it's a good thing for you guys. You guys, either of you, sharing preamps with the, your super oh, yeah. monitor guys? You, you share any preamps? Yeah. Okay. I, I do, I've never done it. You, you don't. Okay. This is where we Just, differ. I yeah, uh, right. I always not always. Um, I would say in the last five years, uh, okay. I have decided to share preamps with yeah. whoever I work if yeah. I trust them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's kind of funny because in my TV music world, you know, mixing these TV award lightning shows, I get, like you said at the beginning, it's like, here's your two Dante feeds and you're getting all the 128 inputs, that's it. There's no mm -hmm. nothing. It's like you get nobody and you never get asked about the microphones. The, t the truck the truck person is making the call and then maybe the monitor person, you, you will get whatever mic they choose for you and here's your Dante <laughs> feed. And you don't get a preamp either. I was like, Great. good luck. We're all counting on it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <Exactly. laughs> no pressure. You're only mixing in front of house. Um, you know, the the way you craft it, we're going to talk a little bit about this when we get into the, the nuts and bolts of mixing. But uh, from the console perspective, you also need a console that, uh, you know, reliability, double power supply, blah, blah, blah. But metering, uh, you know, Puch and I, you were talking the other day about I miss mixing on the gamble, not just for the preamp and the EQ, but because of the meter bridge. You know, you had all totally. those meters right there. How much do you rely on your input or busing metering? Is that on, on the console? That's critical for you? Uh, so this, Chris and I differ on this a little bit too. Um, Chris is like hip to knowing what's happening exactly on his metering you know he's talked several times in our pooch and rebel thing about mm -hmm. how you know he's paying attention to stuff my i'm way more lax about that on the input side so my inputs i am gaining things up and listening to them and not so much paying attention yeah. Uh, to the meter, I'm paying attention to obviously, you know, fader resolution and how it sounds. That's important. But like, I don't look at it and go, okay, I want all my inputs to be at minus 20, which is not what Chris does either. But he's way more close thinking about that kind of shit, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's yeah. close to what I do. Okay. <laughs> but but I am, um, you know, fader resolution gain up and whatever sounds good on the mic pre is kind of where things end up. And sometimes mm -hmm. I use digital trim because mm -hmm. the mic pre sounds better hotter or or right less. And you um, tend to drive but, them pretty hot yeah, yeah um sometimes you know it depends uh mm -hmm. especially like if i want something colored on the mm -hmm. uh, 32 bit cards if you start mm -hmm. hitting them harder they start having a kind of a biasing thing like old school mm -hmm. xl4 used sure. to sure sure so turning them turning the mic pre up more gets kind of that sound that you want and then to make the fader resolution be zero you take digital trim and, and turn it down yeah, um, I do some of that. But what's when metering becomes important to me is summing after mm. all of my inputs, then it's like I pay great attention to whenever things are getting summed and the overall result of where that ends so up. So you need a platform mixing wise where you can all your bosses, you can see all your boss metering at all times. That that is important to me. And I do yeah. like with Digico, I drag on the overview screen mm -hmm. is all kinds of busing. Sure. So that I can see what's what's up. Yeah. Chris. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, Raul, you mentioned the, um, you know, the gold standard of metering, which was the gamble. Um, yeah. And, and, and honestly, to me, it's neck and neck. I so highly valued the XL4 mm. um, meter bridge. Mm -hmm. Yep. Even its placement, the fact that yeah. it's, you, you know yeah, what I mean? Like 
Yeah. That's one of the things, the greatest things that Digico did with their consoles. And they, you know, when the D5 came out and then in turn with the, with the SD7, of course the SD5 does it too, mm -hmm. is that meter bridge. Yeah. Um, I, I had a gig earlier in COVID and it was a nothing gig. It was like piano and vocal. And I asked for, I had a five, seven or a five. And someone was like, what could SD11 not do it? And I was like, it absolutely can, I'm blind. Mm -hmm. I'm not yes. super blind, but my eyes are not getting any better. And I like my meter bridge. Yeah, and yes. just yesterday, I've had to like get over myself in this <laughs> way that I'm embarrassed to spec. Sometimes yesterday I have a gig coming up where it is uh, this one portion of a gig is just going to be some playback and then maybe four vocals I asked for an SD7. And you know why? <laughs> you got it. I did. Yeah. Now, I also know that this gig Spoiled is going to turn brat. It, totally. And I know so many people hearing this right now are just completely disgusted at themselves. Delete, 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 yeah. delete, delete. But I'll tell you what, man, here's the deal. That's what I use. Yep. That's yes. just the platform that I use. The meter bridge is what I'm specking. And yeah. SD11 can a thousand percent do everything I need it to do. Absolutely. And on an ergonomics level, the not just the main master section with the 12 faders, but the section above it. Yes, on an the SD7, small faders are what matters. The small faders are invaluable yeah. Yeah. when it comes to all the extra shit that gets thrown your way mm -hmm. in certain scenarios to, again, keep an eye on things. So, yeah, to me, metering is of paramount. I think it's, it's difficult for people sometimes to kind of uh, get a clear picture of the fact that you are sort of looking at hundreds of things happening at once. Mm -hmm. And then that's the part where you, you need to, you know, it's like flying. I, so I was telling Pooch, I said, look, if you're going to fly a plane from here to LA, it's one thing. But if you're going to Mars, your spaceship needs a few more things yeah. in front of you, yeah. right? You need to be right. monitoring a few more things. Yeah. And same thing, you know, you're flying the spaceship to Mars, uh, no pun intended, uh, on your tours. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the amount of visual cues and information that you're getting, it's not just what you hear. Sometimes you hear something and you need to very quickly see a visual cue to tell you what's going on. Right. And, yeah. And, and, and hear, know. hear this, that, you know, yes, we are blessed and get to work on some of the best gear in the world. But yeah. also when Chris and I go do Bob's backyard barbecue, you know, I, I did a iTunes gig once where they literally handed me a Mackie and, yeah. and I had to get a result, right? Totally. So, yes. so it's not, you know, yes, yes, we're blessed. We get the best gear. We, and when we can spec it, we do, but yes. we are like you guys, yes. we are, we have to make it sound good on whatever we get. And that yeah. being said, Pooch, and I'll say this here, I know uh, you both have been working on Digicus a long time. I think, uh, Chris, you probably started on the D5 back in 2005. Um, but, uh, I, I, you have also burned hundreds, thousands of hours learning every detail of your platform, whatever yes. platform is yeah. that you're mixing on. So it, you're, yeah. you're not showing up to a production rehearsal kind of, oh, let me figure this console out. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we've run into me as a system engineer, sometimes our demo rigs, when we're on the field, we've had people request, you know, a whatever, I mean, this console. And then they show up and go, hey, can you help me program this thing? I'm going, no, <laughs> no, I don't know that console. It's crazy to me. It, yeah, but it happens yeah. more yeah. than we think it happens, right? Mm -hmm. And it's so right. something to be uh, aware of. I think other things that for you guys, uh, I know you guys do a lot of prep work ahead of time. Obviously the offline editor snapshot control for you guys, pretty heavy. Are you a lot into snapshot? I don't know on Maiden if you're doing a lot of snapshotting or, or not. Mm -hmm. I, uh, we, uh, this is a great conversation. Uh, Chris and I differ on this a little bit too, but um, uh, I'm a uh, one song, one snapshot per song guy, unless mm. there is more parameter changes than I can do manually from mm -hmm. verse to chorus or, you know, whatever, which sure. happens on a, I would say a 20% basis. So there, sure. if you're looking at my snapshots, you'll see <clears throat> song, 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 and then six snapshots for one song you know right. what i mean so it, it it's not like i don't ever make other snapshots for stuff um and, and then how we build our snapshots you know chris and i have had this conversation um on our our uh pooch and raybold thing um we build them differently um i i tend to start in the full safe mode mm -hmm. um and then only unsafe things that i want to change as i'm going and mm -hmm. that includes even to the depth of individual channel 
unsafing of just the EQ of that individual channel sure. um, to change. So, uh, and it just works in my head. I don't want anything changing or recalling on my console. Let me be clear about that because I record everything gets recorded. Right. What recalls is what I make changes to. Um, uh, and so Chris, take it from there. What, I, how's your mode of operation? Yeah, I know I was trying to think, cause again, I just, just did a gig. I keep saying that it's just, I'm, I'm so excited to be able to say it. <laughs> and, uh, it was, and I did, st I started building snapshots in the middle of it. I too, we, we don't differ too much. No, we don't. I mean, like I start with, like you said, the, the point for everyone to hear is that automation is being written continuously. Yes. It's what we choose to then activate, mm -hmm. you know? And so like I start with everything. I'll usually do it on a double layer basis. I'll go into the re global scope will be pretty much wide open where everything's mm -hmm. being written. I may, and this actually bit me in the ass the other day because I didn't do it and I, and I know better. I usually do it. I go in and I'll um, turn off the gains. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was just going to say, on, my pre's will screw you over. Don't on glo on global scope. Yes. You know, those will be the only, only things turned off. And unless there's something else I know I'm just not going to use. But everything has the ability to be written. Then I'll go in and I will, I'll do it one of two ways. But in the global scope, or excuse me, in the recall scope per song, I might turn some things on uh, in there uh, initially. But then the next step, or I might not, it might all be X'd out. But then the next step is I go on to the channel and I safe all of those channels. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're, so we do a song. I don't, I don't write anything. I, I don't, for a while I just mix. But then once we start running songs, I'll start saving, mm -hmm. yeah. but I won't turn anything on. What I might do at that time and like what I did the other day is I went in and I went, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm ready to engage fader and mute on mm. these certain things. That's right. And so, and it's a double layer move. I go into the recall scope, mm -hmm. I turn it on there, then I go to the channel and take it out of safe there. So again, you hear what Pooch and I are saying too, it's if anything, we're like insanely cautious to not have anything do something. Yeah, right. that's right. It's you almost know? approaching analog mode. Yeah, and it just yeah, yeah. depends for me it depends on this the nature of the show what do i need to do i'd love it if i can just keep it to fader and mute yeah, but I mean, chances are eq is going to come into play you know dynamics i hope i don't have to automate dynamics but there's a few kind of inputs that might call for that you know mm -hmm, panning mm -hmm. maybe but um but do i go deep into it i do but um it's usually just one per song, but no, there's, there's usually a lot going on. It just depends on the act. It depends on how intricate it is. And speaking of checking all your snapshots, you know, microphones, mixing consoles, a couple of extra tools, you know, to hammer out your gig, you know, you carry a, a little a few pieces of analog outboard gear. You also use a, you know, a couple of live racks, I believe. Uh, and then put you have uh, wave servers. You also have a Bricasti, a couple of reverbs. And we were talking about extra tools outside in the toolbox. The one that was kind of key was the ability to have a virtual sound check system. And I said, I was, we were talking about this and I said, what if you showed up tomorrow and you had a choice? You can have your Bricasti's or you can have your virtual sound check system. What are you That's not choose? even a question. It's not <laughs> even a question. No. Right. So you have right. fun with the Bricasti's because I'm taking the virtual sound check. Yeah. Right. So at, at, at your uh, level, it's become not just an extra tool. It's become a fundamental part of your process, would you say? It's so ingrained in me that like I carry around an MGB with me because I'm worried that so someone's not going to have it when I show sure. up to a gig. I mean, it is um, even for a one off mm -hmm. that time period between that sound check yeah. and doors yes. I spend with virtual sound check just fixing the little things it's the little things that matter not the big yeah. picture right it's the gate making sure that all the gates on all your drums yeah. are are you know triggering properly yeah. you know all of that is you need virtual sound check in order to you know get all those things yeah. working so yeah, yeah virtual sound check is I, I even told you i think yesterday that if you offered me virtual sound check and an m32 
or Digico without virtual sound check, I'd take the N32 in the business. I 1,000% agree with that statement. Yep. And and for the audience, just remember that your artists are not coming to sound check. Uh, that's just let's, well, cl- let's yeah. clarify that for the audience. I said, look, there is no band coming to sound check. Number one, but number two, I mean, you know, I've always tell all of uh, you know the grad students that I work with. I said, look, record everything when you start mixing in your career. Just because of technology costs coming down, just record everything that you're doing. And if you cannot don't have the ability to record, you know, sixty four tracks, just record your music bus and your vocal bus, so you have an idea of where you are after you got done with rehearsal. You know, just record and go back and listen. Here's the thing, man. The difference between a great engineer and a world-class engineer is about 10%. Mm -hmm. It's the Mm -hmm. little tiny details that, um, you know, Chris does in order to make his mix be world-class that he couldn't do without Mm -hmm. virtual sound check. Like, I look back on my career and I'm like, I have no idea how I, yeah. how well, I functioned. But if you think back to check. 20 years ago on that yeah. Kiss tour in Australia, we had sound checks that went for an hour and a half. Yeah, and but it, even at that though, you it, don't, it's not the sound check. It's, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's sitting with a pair of headphones and getting the super detailed stuff. Mm-hmm. And right. now here, we, you know, 20 years later, speaker technology is so damn mm-hmm. good. Yes. It's like having a pair of near fields in front of you. So you better have it record quality. Yeah. And if you don't, then you're just a great engineer. You're not and a world class That's engineer. a great intro into our mixing conversation. Um, you know, what you guys have, have you know, Put you're dealing with the band that is the iconic heavy metal band that we all grew up with you know latin america is staying great when you're a child you must listen to iron maiden you know uh and rabel you know some the list of grammys between the artists that you have been mixing is just staggering which is yeah, don't ask me how that culture. happened <laughs> well you know i was i was, I was looking at a, a picture on a magazine like three days ago and it was there were four tours featuring that page and three of those mega tours you have been mixing on rotation. Yeah, it's weird. If anything, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. COVID has kind of scared me because the past decade I haven't stopped. Mm. And now I'm like, oh, shit. (laughs) Like, I do what? I do who with what? I'm like, oh, you know what I mean? It was better when it was just, I was just the hamster on the wheel and just kept going. Nowhere to hide now, buddy. I'm I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Yeah. So what what is your when you start approaching these these mega projects, you know what is your mix goal? Are you gonna recreate the CD? Are you gonna make it a total live experience? Do the artists come and tell you this is how I want it? What is what is the, how does that happen at the stratospheric level you're at? Okay, for me, I think it's a little bit different. I mean, maybe not, but but here I work for an iconic band. I work for a band that when I was 16 years old, I was in my room with circus magazine posters on the wall yes. of Steve Harris <laughs> right. listening to this band. And so there people that were 16 then are now in their mid fifties and coming to shows and they've heard the same song for 35 yeah. years. Right. And they expect it to sound like the record that they heard you know, mm. when they were 16 years old and through through that time period. So my I I use the term I like to make a record mix with impact. OK, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. it means it sounds like the record, like I am shooting for it to sound like the record, but to have uh, maybe a little bit more slanted low end to try to move some air in the room, sure. um, you know, which is a difficult thing with Iron Maiden, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, they don't have any instruments that make low end. So um, you know, it, it's, I, I shoot for record quality with impact. What, what's your goal there, Chris? <clears throat> yeah. And you know, I've always liked that statement of yours, that phrase of yours. Um, I would mimic that in that I want record quality, meaning yeah. I don't just want to be, I had this conversation with someone yesterday. I don't just want to be like a good sounding live show mm-hmm. because that is one thing. You know, mm-hmm. I want to be a, I just want to be the, a, a, a top tier, high end, oral experience all around. 
within okay. the realms of what we can do. Let's yeah. be honest. You sure. know, again, sure. I often talk about the fact that we mix in concrete barns. Like, let's <laughs> everybody get real. You know. Yeah. But. But I do shoot for that um, as far as that level of quality, that level of performance. Um, and I, I'm at a point now, and I don't want to get too in the ether, too artsy about it all, but I almost don't even think about how I'm going to do it or what I'm trying to do. I just kind of know mm -hmm. based on the client. Yeah. Like I'll know do they want the record? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or do they want a live show based on the record? Do they not care at all? Do I there's just there's there's this kind of thing where you just know what to do. And I'll know. say this too, as time has gone on, you know, I've begun to realize I can also listen to an arrangement and mm -hmm. go, everything matters. Everything that's happening matters. So everything needs to be heard. Let's start there, you know, mm -hmm. or this is a mess. They don't know what they want. That's garbage. Lose that. Like, you know, there's all these different various uh, bits of nuance that teach. I'll, I'm just going to tell you this. I'm going to take it. And my, the biggest, harshest critic I'm going to run across for the whole duration of when I work for that artist is going to be myself. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. You know, and I just have a bar set where it is. As far as what they want, it's genre specific. It's artist specific. It's and do you do you tend specific. to get a, a significant input from the artist or their uh, management or their whoever production you'll whoever. you'll figure you'll know it before you step foot behind yeah. a piece of gear. Absolutely, yeah, what, what the vibe is important for sure. Yeah. So uh, the, the thing for the, the other things. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, no, go ahead. You, you know, the other thing that I wanted to point out about that was. Uh, it, it's, have you, Chris, have you ever like a year and a half into a tour gone back and compared your mix to what the record is? I do that a lot sometimes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's, it's interesting. The direction that I've gone is mm -hmm. away from the record. Like it's definitely mm -hmm. the, the, the piece of the record is there and it's enough that everyone is like, you know, gets it that oh it, it is kind of like the record but i it what's great about what we do is i i get to kind of put my spin on it a little bit and as a tour goes on it kind of goes that direction always but sometimes a year and a half in i'll listen to it and go oh i've gone too far yeah or i'll realize yes or i'll think to myself man how have they been okay with me not featuring that sound you know <laughs> yeah right i've had that happen before yeah. how did you i know? get away with that nobody called oh, yeah. me on that you no know, yeah. one's called me out on it or are they have they been pissed for a year and a half? Yeah. No, but see, the other part of that is, is that some artists don't want it to be exactly like the record. They exactly. like that it's got a little difference, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Um, and so, you know, if you head down that road and you get there, the artist may already be going, oh, that's cool. He does that one thing that's not on the record or, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, I had an artist, um, I, I'll go ahead and say, I, I was working with, when I first started working with Bruno, yeah. Uh, several several years ago he was just they weren't even done mixing the record and we're in promo because we're gearing up for the tv stuff and this and that and it's like i didn't i mean i didn't that that's a tough camp i didn't show up to fanfare being carried in <laughs> on it's not what you think welcome it's, chris rabel <laughs> yeah no it's trial we're by not fire worth it. we're not worth yeah. it <laughs> no man those guys are right they're yeah. like what do you got yeah, yeah, they're sharks, totally. And so, yeah. like, they're like at the beginning, they're kind of like, eh. And then after a while, that you know, they're starting to warm up. And like, there was, of course, like things kind of working. I remember we were in this one studio that sounded terrible. We moved studios. I swear to God, I didn't touch a thing. Guess what? Suddenly, was way better. The mix. Mm -hmm. I hadn't done a damn thing. It was the room, you know. Right. Of course. Anyway, anyway, after a while, I finally heard not even the finished version of the song that we were working on but the just the latest version yeah and i just looked at him and i'm like how have you not fired me yet because what <laughs> i'm doing right. sounds nothing like this because yeah. the stems we had oh, sounded wow. nothing like that you yeah, know what i mean right. 
Yeah, so no, I don't. I don't even remember where this started, but um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. As, as, as far as like knowing the source, yeah, I've been just yeah. like, dude, I'm nowhere close, but also you guys put me nowhere close. You know, big you know? For, yeah. for the audience to realize that at, at that level of, of uh, touring there in general, uh, there's going to be certain amount of production rehearsal that could be, you know, three days or it could be three weeks or whatnot. And I think that, you know, Puchana, you, you, know, you, you have talked about this before, which is that I think a lot of people think that because you have three weeks of production rehearsals, you can show up unprepared and just figure it out when you get there. You guys are probably two of the most disciplined engineers in the business. And I know that when you come to the first day of production rehearsal, you are 90% of, you know, offline editing. You got your sources sorted out. You got a lot of stuff. Uh, and I think people also forget that even though there is no audience, general audience at these production rehearsals, the audience that you do have, the artists, the management, the band members, the musical director, uh, has a very important uh, opinion. So you have to deliver very quickly. So I, I'm, I'd be curious to talk about, you know, the process when you're crafting your mix, you know, how when you get into production rehearsals, how fast, you know, you have to be sort of be able to deliver a good mix. Oh, it's um, r right away. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. real deal is, you know, people always say, oh, well, you always have, you have three weeks of rehearsal before a tour. And, but I tell you what, if you don't have your shit together in the first day or yeah. two, yeah. and an artist wants to come in after the second day, if it doesn't kind of already be yeah. pumping, yeah. you're gone. I mean, so, um, you know, I, I am held to the same standard that other people are without the three weeks of rehearsal. It's the, the next two weeks after that is when I do the little things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, spreading things out and making more room for vocal and the little things that they may not even notice that I'm doing in order to mm -hmm. create. Mm -hmm. but, but getting the badass mix is like by day two. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would assume, you know, it's like I remember being on production rehearsals with Kravitz and Dave Natal, and it's like day one, and it's like, that, you know, Kravitz would sit and, you know, Dave had been working on the snare for five seconds. He goes, are you done let's yet? Let's hear it. Let's, yeah. let's stop, you know, and it's like kind of a thing, right, where I think people sometimes forget the amount of, <laughs> of stress that, that you guys run into when you walk into that production rehearsals. There's a level of expectation to deliver whatever that is, you know. I have, I have strategically placed cases in rooms like you know nowadays with uh with playback mm -hmm. and the way rehearsals run now if we're not always we might not be starting rehearsal in front of pa we might sure. be starting rehearsals in with in a near field yep. situation i have strategically placed cases and trash cans <laughs> so that when the artist walks in the room the feng shui of the room <laughs> directs them <laughs> to something of a decent yeah. listening environment or yeah. and I, I think i've mentioned this on the show before if you ever have to do a show and there is a the god damn creative table you right. know which is where all these who whatever the super important people are like you're in the arena mm. i have tuned i have For moved that. on and moved that table before they show up damn in right. anticipation <laughs> of the artist walking in sitting down smoking a cigarette looking at their phone casually listening like be yeah. ready yes. be ready you yes. know and you never know who else is coming with them that is influential who, to their ear and who might be like yeah this new guy he's yeah it sounds really good because no, and, and yeah you just you don't know be ready it matters and it's going to matter quick something important there on on all the work that you have to do not just on ear fills for sometimes on headphones and we have talked about this before which is the the importance of knowing and trusting your mix on headphones and ear fills because in other words you could be chasing your mix forever you need to know on headphones and or near fills, you know, because you're not going to be mixing on PA for a while. You need to know, you know, the way the mix is actually, you know, working out. Uh, do you recall at what point in time in your career you kind of went, I've got a method. I know that what I'm hearing on my headphones or my near fills will, will, it's a good mix. It's a CD quality mix or close to that will translate into the PA. That's a great I think question. It's, it, it's when speaker technology finally got, pretty linear mm -hmm. um you know then then i was like okay a pair of near fields that's pretty linear linear if i get it right on that it's gonna mm -hmm. translate well yeah. um at least for me what were you gonna say chris sorry yeah no i was just saying that's a great question and i would like to tell you it was 20 years ago and it wasn't <laughs> 
I, 20 years ago, we were still high fiving <laughs> if you could hear the vocal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really wasn't that long ago. Right. Like for me, I kind of have a, I say I have a formula. I have yet again a series of habits that get me there. But yeah, I really think it was in the last, you know, whatever, 10. Yeah. That, that the PAs have caught up. I know what near fields to use. I know what headphones to use. I know what tuning process to use. It's, I, I would like to tell you it was, it wasn't that, it really wasn't that yeah. long ago because everything, all things weren't equal, you know? And the point to the audience that I'm trying to make is it's fundamental that you learn the process mm. by whichever way you get there that you figure out that the mix that you're hearing on your, on your cans or your near fields is a good enough CD quality mix that is going to ultimately translate. Because if you well, don't know how to judge that, you could, could keep twisting nuts for days on end. Yeah. And this is where we get into, you know, people um, will ask myself and Pooch because we've now put ourselves out there to the degree that we have about certain mixing techniques live. Mm -hmm. And if you'll follow one series of re re repetitiveness that we have is that, you know, our mix my mix needs to work on this laptop underneath my finger as much as it needs to work on the PA. And they mm -hmm. really don't vary. It, there's not a lot of variance in right. that. Right. And if you start doing things specific, you will inherently, you will, you will be in a bad room. You will be happy an underpowered PA. You will blah, 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 blah. But the more you can keep your own process streamlined, I just don't see why people make things so damn hard on themselves. Like just have a mix just mm -hmm. that's your mix you know yeah. and let it and think be always thinking that it should translate in whatever medium it could possibly end up on and that's something if people really listen closely they'll hear us harp on in, um, yeah absolutely you know. in one of the previous sessions that we had put here uh, we talked about target curves and i know uh chris that you you know are yourself a tweakaholic of system tuning, even though you have worked with some of the great system engineers of our time, like Solly, mm -hmm. you know, and big shout out to him. Um, one of the topics that I like people to be aware of is that, you know, what I call do not chase the PA uh, on your mix. In other mm -hmm. words, remember, once you got done with production rehearsals, you pretty much have a dial mix kind of, you know, do not fix the PA on your mix. I've seen that many times where we have incoming engineers who are continuously changing the mix that they recall that day. And they're just chasing something that is part of the PA as supposed to actually talking to the system engineer right. or having a target curve to mix to. Uh, how does that affect you? Are you? You keep your mix pretty static and you have a target curve? Yeah, I mean, I refer to it as, you know, the, the uh, production manager calling me, I need to call him back later, the uh, separation of church and state. Like you have I, a gig. You have a gig. <laughs> uh, I know. I know my mix is what it right. is, right. and I know it, and I know it, and I know it, and I know it. So when the PA comes on, it really is having that inner calm. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. Is guys might know their mix intimately, yet when it starts coming out, it's not right, and they 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 panic yeah. and they right. want to fix it really quickly. And that's when you need to be professional enough to go. Mm, not arrogant enough to go, it's not me, but to right. go, no, no, Does I know that, my mix doesn't do that. That it's, collaborative relationship, sort of a symbiotic thing with your system engineer, put yeah. case with me, then you have two system engineers, you know, so, but we, you and I have talked a lot about the, the importance of that symbiotic relationship so that your mix translates properly, you know, but yeah, do not go, don't go chasing, don't go destroying your, your hard work from production rehearsals, you know? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, um, just to touch on this real quick, the I my mix stays the same. It's the PA part that I change from day to day on what's going on around the room. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to take us back one more step from when we were talking about one mix. Um, also, a, a super big gig keeper is once you deliver your mix to anyone, go see where the end result is. Because mm -hmm. I can't tell you a hundred times I've gone to video land and mm -hmm. I've handed them two cables that is my mix and what they've done to it is unbelievable. Like, you know, you. distorted, uh, panned all the way right, you know, all these kind of things. And that is the end result of what that artist is going to watch. Right. And that artist is going to watch it and go, well, why is 
this guy's my sound guy, like seriously, you know? So it's important. I just wanted to touch on that. You know, we, yeah. we went off on a tangent here, but I wanted to, to uh, say to you that I always tell every, all of my techs, if you hand my mix to anyone, find out where it's going and we need to hear the end result of it. Yeah, absolutely. Always good yeah. to have somebody you trust on your on your on your team, and I think that's key because you know you spend a lot of time crafting your mix, and you know, so it's important to make sure that the ultimate medium is is delivering what you has you know worked on so hard. And yeah, so that's that's, right. that's 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 important. But um, back to the PA yeah. thing, yeah, I'm I'm the guy that you know, and I know Chris is this guy too. We have worked hours and hours and hours on what's coming out of our left and right. Right. Yeah. And we know it intimately. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we're talking about, you know, um, EQing and, and those kind of things, it's never on the, the mix. You know, it's always creating that mix and that mix now goes to speaker processor and in the speaker processor is where we make decisions mm -hmm. and major decisions about what's how what's going to come out of the big speakers. Right. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, let's uh, uh, dig into a couple of topics, relate, more nuts and bolts of your actual mm, mixing process, if you will. Um, let's talk for a minute. We, we have all talked about this before, but the on the input side of things, uh, the importance of starting with a good source. We touched a little bit about this earlier. I'm kind of curious do you guys go to the stage and retweak the uh, mics uh, for pretty much every gig or how does that work? The importance of having a good source when you start. Chris. Yeah. Uh, well, this is God, this is 75 hours of conversation right here, to be honest <laughs> right. with you, but well, um, <laughs> I'll take the five second version. To answer your question, as far as, before we get to the mic, um, I'll, I will walk and listen to the source um and there's an art in doing that too to where you're not doing it in too much of a judgy way it's it's typically mm. if i can find the right political moment to have a casual conversation with each player if i haven't done it beforehand unless it's just some gigantic band you can't make it to everyone about about their amp about their tone about their whatever it might be whatever the instrument might be to kind of get an idea you know right. um if you have the time if it's a throw and go man you're just going it's like mm -hmm. you saying you're getting your Dante lines and you're, you yep. don't even know what the mic is and you got to mix nope. and you got to go. Yep. But um, I will do as much research as I can as to what I'm getting before I get it. I can oftentimes go ahead and tell you from the input I get back. And I mean like input, like verbal conversation, email, mm -hmm. stories from others on what the player is going to be before it even turns on. Now, okay. as far as with those individual sounds, as far as the microphone placement, I have very specific standard starting spots. Mm -hmm. And I tell all my guys, all my stage guys, I'm like, you know, I'll show them exactly where I want the stand, exactly where I want the clip, exactly where I'm like, you get me ballpark every day. Make it your goal to where I don't touch anything, but mm -hmm. I'm probably going to tweak anyway, but just sometimes I just move it right where you just had it. Make that your <laughs> like smile, you know, okay. but I know, like, I know where I like to mic a guitar cabinet sure. and I know where I'm going to start. Will I change it if that's not working? Of course, a hundred percent. But, um, and this goes back to like knowing your microphones. Well, knowing your microphone placement, no, sure. no, your no, your default. Starting and do, do you experiment a little bit during production rehearsals? You might go, okay, I will. you know, move things a little bit or maybe I will. switch them. Good. Yep. Butch, I know yeah. you're you're tweaking about your drum mics. Uh, about all my mics. I mean, mm. I am. Um, uh, you know, listen. I trust my techs to do the best that they can. Mm. Um, but uh, even at that, I have found in the past that uh, I'll show up on stage and look at microphones, and they'll yeah. be, you know, a half an inch away from where I need it to be. And a half an inch in a guitar cabin, for example, is a lot miles yeah. different in tone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I, I do the same thing. I, I uh, guys set it up and, um, you know, I come back behind them and, and have a look at it every single mm. day. Um, I cannot stress enough. Nobody talks about this, but when I have a sound company that shows up with shitty stands, I want to... <sighs> 
stab them in the face. Yeah. Like a stand is just as important as the microphone. Or like, crappy or crappy mics, you know, great mics have been Well, that up too, like, but it, but to me know? the the number one thing that I always see from a one-off, you know, sta standpoint is a guy shows up with a case full of stands that look like, you know, They've just been beat up and they, you know, the arms slowly <laughs> fall down. They right? all droop. None of the yeah. tripods will stay firm. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm telling you the most important thing is mic choice, mic placement. So yes. if you're not giving me the tools to so, keep that microphone in that placement, that is so important. Yes. Then why are we here? Right? So there you go. So, if, if your mic stands are covered on duct tape, thou shall not bring them to <laughs> your gig. Just, um, I, you know, I can't stress enough to people out there, sound companies out there, you know, the, the having a great mic stand is, is just as important as the microphone. That's good. True. So obviously these all ties, you know, I, I, I would guess that the input metering side of things could immediately tell you when something is either in the wrong place or maybe the mic is dead now or something is whatever. So there's a relationship there where I think you guys have gotten to that level where you can intrinsically look at your metering and go something is off at the input side. Oh yeah, definitely. When I said earlier that I don't really look at input metering, here's where I differ. I once we get going, input metering to me is the tool that I use to be like, mm, something's wrong. I need mm -hmm. to go see what's going on. That's sure. 3db hotter today or 3db less today. Sure. So I learn, I memorize where all my inputs are and where they, mm -hmm. you know, over a course of the first month of a tour, I know exactly where my input yeah. meters are so that I know when something is not yeah. working properly. Or, you know, awesome. you see, you see somebody plug a keyboard in and the left channel has this going on yeah. and there's yeah. it's like, okay, but before you even know it, yeah. you're like, yeah. you're like yeah. guys, something's up, yeah. right. you know? What in the, you know, the, on the SC7s, you guys have a plethora of tools on the input strip. Uh, would you say you're high pass? Are you a, a heavy user of high pass, low pass? Is that a key thing for you? Or you go, eh, maybe, maybe not. It's like, I've always found into a, a lot of one of gigs that it's the, the most underused uh, tool in the input is the high pass. Oh, know, absolutely. Like, I mean, it's all over the internet. My, my four tools are yeah. mic choice, mic placement, high pass filter, low pass filter. There you you give me those four and yes. I'll create you a mix. I yeah. don't need mm -hmm. EQ or dynamic or anything mm -hmm. to get you a usable something is those four tools. So is a low pass filter and a high pass filter important to me? It's mm. right after what microphone. Right, yeah. is, it, is there something Chris that you don't high pass? You know, today's nowadays we have, you know, subwoofer system, you know, you guys have used, you know, you're on CP218s, we use G28s, things that go down to like 25 hertz. Are there things that you don't high pass? Yeah, before I answer that question, you know, and I'm here to, and I like to think Pooch and I are good about there are no rules because there aren't. <laughs> But when I hear a high pass is the most underutilized, I'm like, who, who's, who's that? Who's that? And what, <laughs> and what are they doing yeah. behind a console? Yes, you know, we, we have gotten phone calls. Uh, this is true stories. I'm not going to mention any names or companies. Yeah. Where, look, this guy's like, hey, man, he's saying that your PA is not loud enough. You don't have enough subs. Your subs are always limited. And I go, look, go to your input channels, put them all, engage all the high passes at 20 hertz. Oh, look, all the limiters are now gone. Like, <laughs> hmm, funny how that works. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, and it's also, you know, for a, like a younger engineer who's not utilizing, man, you guys don't know how lucky you are because mm -hmm. we had fixed... It might have been a 12 dB per octave at <laughs> right. 80, right. which, good luck. Yes, you exactly. know what I mean? Um, so yeah. are there things that I don't? Yes, there are. Um, actually, there's a lot that I don't. Um, I don't. It's funny, Pooch and I did an episode on high passes, and, uh, and I was telling him that I didn't high pass my toms. And he was like, really? And I, and I, and, and I don't. I don't usually mm -hmm. high pass. I'll high pass them if there is mechanical noise from a stand. Sure. It's making like a low end rumble. Um, uh, bass guitars, I may or may not, I don't want to go through them all. Yeah, there are okay. some things I don't, but I'll tell you this, if I don't, I'm strategically not doing it. It's not, I It's not accidental. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's, it's a hundred percent on purpose that I'm yeah. not doing it. Sure. You know? Part And of, so, um, yeah. part of my default when I show up to a one-off is all oh, yeah. high pass filters engaged. Yeah. Same thing. Um, they're, and, they're, and, and, and at a specific frequency point, like I've already yeah. got things rolled up. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 
yeah. yeah for tv shows i have to i mean i don't have a choice i was like you, you can't have that in the house yeah. so you know i'm curious you are uh, you use several uh, wave servers and you got uh, ua on your stuff plus analog stuff the sd7 itself in the input strip several choices of eq comp so i'm kind of curious not as to what you're using but when you go through the process of Am I going to use the internal compressor or EQ or dynamic EQ on the channel? Or am I going to use uh, something, a plugin from my server? Or am I going to plug in an analog device? Uh, do you have a process by which you go, you know, how do I decide? Am I going to use the one in the strip? And this is, of course, assuming that you have all of these choices. If you, <laughs> you know, right. I don't have those choices, so I'm going to use what's on the strip. But if you have all of these, you know, three categories, you know, what's on the strip? Uh, or what's on the server or the analog rag, how do you go about deciding w which one you're going to choose? You want to do that one first, Pooch? Sure. I mean, for me, anything outboard of a console is the cayenne pepper in the chili, right? So <laughs> the chili is being made over here and it's got yeah. all the ingredients and all the stuff that I need. But man, would this be so much better if it had a little cayenne pepper in it? So okay. they, those are, it's not the go-to as much as I'm known as the plug-in guy. It's like, those are afterthought mm -hmm. stuff. So my mm -hmm. go-to is generally console things. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Okay. I don't have to worry about, you know, a latency. I, I, if on gating, um, I, the side chain for that is super easy. I don't have to have three paths to an output. Yeah, it should, it, it should be good to um, mention to the audience that in your particular case now on this tour, you are triggering your gates, you know, uh, externally. So that's, that's a little advanced topic that you all can go and uh, check out the YouTube channel on that. But yeah, you're trick. How many, how many channels are you triggering? Uh, there's nine toms. <laughs> nine toms. So that's another nine triggers that are coming down on your snake system. And you use Correct. the internal gate to, you know, with an external trigger to open those gates. So that's correct. That's and that. they are anyway. not, we're not triggering sounds. We're triggering right. the threshold of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. So opening um, the gate. And Chris does that as well in all of his drum kits. Um, yeah. But um, uh, so hear me when I say I go to a console first. Mm. If, and, and even with compression, like for instance, on, you know, a, a keyboard, for instance, you know, if yeah. I have uh, 16 stereo channels of keyboards, <laughs> my go-to is not to send all those paths out to waves because yeah. I want a, a super cool compressor. I'm using what's happening in, in the console. And now more and more, you know, mm. um, with the console technology, you know, like Yamaha with their yeah. Wave, Sure. Internal knee processing with yeah. Digico with now they're doing, you know, multi-band compression that exists mm -hmm. in the in the quantum stuff. Um, yeah. So all of the tools are there. Now, when we're talking about money channels, mm -hmm. when we're talking about like the lead vocal, I'm looking for something a little bit more. I want sure. some odd harmonics on that. I want yeah. it to have a specifically tonality type of of compressor on it mm -hmm. um that's when i'm going over to the thing you would uh you'd be you would laugh if you looked at some of my stuff you know everyone thinks that all i do is use plugins but even when we're talking about 125 inputs or 130 inputs with jay-z i think there was only like 28 racks in mm -hmm. that 130 inputs you know mm -hmm. It's not like I'm using all 64 and there's nine plugins on each and, one. You know? And I bring that up because <laughs> you, you guys are at the top level. And I know for a fact that there are people that are using four times as many and it actually right. Im impacts the final result negatively. And so that's why I'm bringing this up. Well, hear me, you do you. And if that works for you, then great. Right. The end result is what matters. So if yeah. I walk up to somebody and go, holy crap, they're using all this stuff um, you know, then, and, but the end result is good. Then who am I yeah. to say, all right, cool. Sure. You do you, but, and, um, yeah, uh, but I find simpler, better, um, use the spices when you want to. And, um, how about you, Chris? Yeah, <clears throat> this is another, it's a great question. It's a great question because there's so many different answers. And also because I think it's something people need to think about mm -hmm. strategically when they're using what, when they also need to hear someone like Pooch, who is, you know, the face of and has been of, of, you know, of waves for years. And it's, yeah. you know, um, 
so I'll say this for me, like you mentioned that I've got the console, I've got hardware, mm -hmm. I've got UAD, I've got waves too. I've got, mm -hmm. okay. I've got everything Look at you the go. Side, and so does Pooch. You know, like it's, or at times we both do. It's yeah. a tool. It's a tool. So this is what it comes down to for me. It comes down to a number. This is another thing that could be a very long conversation, but it comes down to a couple things. One, we're not at the point yet where, like if it's an input and I do want to do some snazzy stuff on it, I want to mm -hmm. use some, some extra stuff. Um, there are certain consoles, SSL is good about this, where you can move the points around. You can move the insert point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm anywhere in the chain yeah Dig digico is fixed different companies have different ways that you can do that what we're not at the point of is where with our fully in the box and i mean in pro tools and a daw counterparts mm -hmm. where you can take any plugin and put it anywhere at all yeah so we're not there so that being said i can't now you can can you get can you get complicated and make it where sound grid for example has your ua in it and then you can move it around within there yes you can you can do that kind of stuff you you mm -hmm. can do some of this but for the most part the way i typically do it is ua lives in ua world waves lives in waves world console lives in console world so what i'm getting at is i will use the onboard first of all i will always use the onboard high pass filter and pooch and i've talked about this before because when all those when all the fancy shit takes the shit yes you that, need high pass <laughs> That high pass is on. It's yes. also right there. I can grab it. You know, um, I've double high passed. I've done mm -hmm. that before, you mm -hmm. know, but the console high pass is always in use. If it is, if I, a lot of times I'll use the, if I'm going to do extra stuff to an input with extra processing, I will use the console strip as the first bit of EQ in line, and it's mainly for subtractive cleanup kind of work. Okay. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, uh, to clean up a bass, to clean up a vocal, to clean up anything that's getting whooped. That, that's the, the, like the cleanup EQ before we maybe get into more of the colored fun stuff mm -hmm. downstream. Also, if I know that it's a, I know it doesn't take long to go to your mouse and to get to your server or to reach over to your rack and do something. But if it's, I'm thinking of a vocalist here, if it's a vocalist and I know, like I've got a lot of vocalists I work for where I essentially play the EQ. Like I move mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. strategically, either chasing them or I just know on certain songs they need to move to here. Sure. And I don't like automating EQ, I'd rather do it. What I'm getting at is if it's an input that I know there's the chance I need to grab quick, mm -hmm. It might not be the most fun, colored, neat, yes, artsy like, piece, but it might yeah. be the safest thing yeah, it's to like do. In a human interface thing as opposed yeah. to trying so to do I, it on the fly. So sure. I'm using the desk either because it doesn't need a lot of EQ, and I don't mm -hmm. need the EQ to be anything other than kind of utilitarian. I'm doing it because I need to get to it quickly, uh, or I'm doing it as the preliminary EQ stage as like a cleanup kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of times I used to have a problem where I would have – I'd be like, oh, I've got this plug in or I've got this piece of hardware on here. I shouldn't be using the desk also. And then I threw that rule book away a long time ago. <laughs> Good. You know? Yeah. One of the topics that you guys have uh, spoken about before is the ability to, I think, Butch, you've talked about these, you know, not two different sources should share the same spectral content. Um, and how do you carve space? So uh, I'd like you to speak a little bit to uh, how do you learn? to EQ inputs in the context of the overall mix, because sometimes, you know, that might take a little bit of experience to, to carve or to shape a particular input in a way that by itself would sound very awkward, yet in the context of the mix, it's what it needs to be so that you have space for something else. So how have you developed that skill of EQ in an input in the context of the mix? Well, First off, um, it, it's been years of ear training. Like mm. I would say to anyone that wants to take it to the advanced level and, you know, be a world-class mixer, um, you know, you should be spending a bunch of time doing blind EQ stuff mm -hmm. and really learning where stuff is. 
Yeah. Uh, it's taken me a long time, 30 years, <laughs> to yeah. get to a point where, you know, I hear a zing and I can tell you exactly what it is. You know what I mean? And so yeah. um, <clears throat> that is key in, in you know, what you're, you're, you're talking about. But in yeah. regards to creating space, this is a really long conversation, yeah, yeah. but um, basically I think of it um uh, along the lines of like a painter let's say you know you can only have so much red in there before the painting gets all weird you know yeah. so sorry my sink is now taking oh, off no oh my god <laughs> yeah. anyway it's, um, it's, it's going with your frozen pipes it is uh, apparently my hot water is now working great um <laughs> What is happening here? <laughs> yes. uh, sorry, guys. So um, like a like a painter, you know, yeah. you say uh, that's too much red. And so frequency wise, I am conscious of what frequency space um, things are being uh, allowed in my mix. So mm. um, in other words, I really think about, hey, the guitar shares that same frequency space that vocal does, for instance, and how am I going to make space? So how do I, what I do with it is by using panning to get that same frequency range away mm -hmm. from that vocal. Sure. So that the same frequency space can be shared, but in a depth or in a width kind of a way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, uh two, yeah. there's three days of conversation there. Yeah, there, I just, there really people... is to be aware of the fact that yeah. some master skill to develop is your ability to EQ instruments in the context of a mix as opposed to EQ in an instrument in a vacuum. We go through this exercise during soundcheck where you solo something and you just listen to that and go, okay, well, you might have a great sounding snare, but that doesn't fit into the mix because right. it's not it's not a snare show, you know, or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, a symphony for kick drum, yes. <laughs> exactly. Just yeah, so you yeah. know, I know we have a few people uh, listening to us, uh, and I think your clock is drifting like uh, yesterday. So just so you know, that's why we're hearing a little bit of distortion every once in a while on, oh, okay. on Pooch's vocal mic. It'll go away at some point in time, we hope. Great. Um, so hey, I need to go deal with my sink. I'll be right back. <laughs> right. All there right. There you go. There we go. So we will continue talking about. Uh, this is busing. what I've always wanted. He's gone. <laughs> My scheme works. This is a Grim and Stempy global control. Oh, Between man, a snowstorm and clock issues, I finally get the floor. I'm amazed. I'm amazed he's actually there. I was yeah. concerned. Yes, last night I'm going, dude, I just hope you have power tomorrow. Right. Um, Which is so true. So the topic of advanced busing. So when we talked about consoles earlier, one of the things I purposely skipped is the fact that the kind of consoles platforms you're mixing on have significant busing capabilities, which is not mm -hmm. common to a, a lot of a lot of consoles. Like my VI platform doesn't do bus to bus mixing. So number one, uh, on the busing side of things, many engineers, you know, will just take all the inputs, assign an input to a particular uh, digital control group, VCA, whichever name we want to use today, and just send everything to left and right. Mm -hmm. Is uh, is this, is that wrong? Can we just do that? Mm -hmm. do Are you, you ever asking? do that? Yeah, I'm asking you. Do we ever do that? Did you ever do that and go? But this is not working for me. I need to do something else. Yeah, no. There, the notion that there is anything wrong at that is right up there to me with like who doesn't use a high pass? No, there's nothing. There's right. nothing wrong. It all depends on what the what the goal of that input is if it's a right. it just of course there's nothing wrong with it it, so it just can, depends yeah. on what the end path mm -hmm. of that thing needs to be per your um per your decision making you sure. know um it yeah. doesn't have to be grouped it doesn't have to go to 30 buses before it hits it's right. really just whatever your prerogative is and um yeah i mean i do a ton of busing but like sure. i haven't always been able to do that mm -hmm. that the consoles didn't used to you you couldn't do that i mean i didn't do any but i it most well, i had like a yeah a few subgroups you know if we had a gamble you got eight stereo subgroups and that's it figure it out yeah i mean i use parallel compression in the analog days and sure. i might group something for some reason but i didn't do i didn't do nearly the grouping that i do now it's kind of like that i said earlier when um if i don't high pass something it's not because i arbitrarily didn't think about it the same yeah. thing holds true with busing you know I, it's I, I, 
I bring this up uh, before we start talking about panel bus uh, mixing or, and bus to bus mixing because mm -hmm. it's a complex process. And if if you're going to enter into this process, just you know, make sure that you know exactly what you're doing before you just go, well, I saw these on Pooch and Rabel's YouTube channel. I'm going to go four levels deep on my drum busing just because they do it. I'm going to do it. So right. know, make sure you understand why you're going into it and the consequences of it. Um, you know, that being said, also at this scale that you, the number of inputs that you're managing, there are other logistical reasons to group things. And I like, you know, Pooch, you know, I talked about this before, which is sometimes you're just grouping things because you have to give something to somebody else at some point in time. So I'd like you to speak to that. Uh, you know, for particular. sure. I mean, you know, a lot of the choices, <laughs> how's my microphone, by the way? It's, okay. it's back. It's, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's okay. It's distorting it's again, but it, no, right. but it's okay. Sometimes I speak louder. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, um, a, it's a clock thing. It's okay. Okay, neat. Uh, that's a new thing. Great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it what must be the, go, is the, is the weather, the clock is frozen. What else can go wrong? What else do we have going on? Um, no. Um, so, uh, one of the reasons that I do a lot of bus to bus mixing is exactly what you just said. So that I'm setting myself up for success in mm. any sort of situation, uh, where, uh, you know, anybody can ask me for anything and I can give it to them. They want sure. the drums by themselves. Cool. They want uh, drums without the parallel drum bus, fine. You want a uh, stage left guitar player only without effects, great. And the only reason that I have all of that to hand to someone is because before I even started listening to things, I've set up my bus structure so that all of that stuff is available to me to ship somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the reasons why I have a million buses when I build a you know, a, right. a 64 input thing on an SD7 console, I use up almost all the DSP <laughs> because of the amount of buses that I'm building. Same. Right. Um, and we'll talk in a minute here about your both of your drum bus architecture so they kind of get a, a better understanding of how many levels deep we're going from, yeah. you know, bus to bus before we get to the master bus. Um, but it's one of the reasons, yeah. it's one of the reasons that you set up yourself for that is, sure. is so and, that and you could hand that to anyone. And heavily to create a particular sonic, you know, signature sound that you're kind of going after to go, okay, I need all these inputs grouped together, process or whatnot. I think there's, I think I counted yesterday, 620 videos on parallel bus compression. For, for, for those of you who are new to this, you can go Google parallel bus compression, but, you know, the same sources are going to go to two or more different audio groups, audio buses, and one of them might get called squash or crush or basically heavily compressed, okay? And you're gonna blend the non-compressed with the compressed. So anyway, uh, I'm kind of curious because you guys have done the plethora, I've talked about that forever. Do you do any parallel busing for other reasons where you are using the parallel bus for something else besides heavy compression? Some, you might be doing a different effect, mm -hmm. uh, spreading sources, EQ, the group different. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I was thinking, you know, the parallel compression is the most common use of parallel processing. Correct. But it is by no means the only thing that you can do. Yes. Parallel. And yes. people get people get stuck on that. And they also get stuck on the fact that you can only do parallel drum bus compression. Like there's again, yeah. there's no parallel literally just means they are running one and, and, yeah one and, source and into two with things one another yeah, right exactly um so do i yes i'll use like on bass i'll have a uh sometimes i'll work the distortion into the main channel but a lot of times if i have my druthers i will do parallel processing on bass and one of those mm -hmm. channels is uh is distortion mm -hmm. um i have used processors that do parallel eq mm-hmm you know, um, to be honest, sometimes with going back to sort of old faithful drum parallel processing, sometimes there will be an EQ mm. on one of those buses. Sure. Um, it's usually distort. I mean, the, the way the way that you're going to find it most often is going to be compression, distortion, or some sort of tonal variance. Yeah. And you yeah. do that a lot. I know you told me that sometimes you have three buses for drums, right? So you yeah. do drum bus, parallel crush, 
and mm -hmm. then a ton tonal kind of a bus, right? Yeah, or I'll do it, and it depends if I have the time to do it. Like I mentioned, I had this gig last week, and I just kept it simple and just had <laughs> one parallel bus. Um, but what I'll do is if I know, and again, this is this goes back to like knowing your microphones. If you know your mm -hmm. compression sounds that you're going for, compressor types, whether those are the actual compressors or emulations of, or you just know the sound that you like, mm -hmm. ideally what I'll do is I'll have two buses doing the parallel thing, and I reserve the right to mute one of them, or yeah. I might blend, um, but like one will be like, I like a snappy VCA type sound. Mm -hmm. I like that traditional sound but i also like a kind of distorted sound and also the version of distortion you can get from a fet based comp mm -hmm. or some other comp i could make it like a really gluey gooey kind of thing mm -hmm. to where i have those to mix and match um yeah. in there and that that's become a thing and also i choose to i might put different things in those but they might not those buses might not look the same either and, and just for people's kind of visualization here, you know, and the way you're structuring, you said three levels of bussing and, and, and which we can talk about your your drum bus setup. This is a so one of the pros of this is that, yeah, you can get a signature sound when you bus things like this and you can make things available to other people. But there are some cons to the, to the process, which is Big that, time. first of all, you might, might your console might not do bus to bus mixing. In mm. other words, this audio group is going to go into this audio group into this final drums group before it gets to the instruments bus. So now you have gone through four audio groups before you get out of the console. Some consoles will not do that, right? And the second con is that, I, you know, Puch and I have talked about this before, which is uh, you gotta keep track of what you're doing because you know, you're gonna go four levels deep into a rabbit hole. Uh, at some point in time, you might need to go, oh wait, this is on subgroup level three down, you know? So just just keeping that, that in mind. And then lastly, there's a latency, uh, price you got to pay every time you go through a, another group you're adding some level of latency it's no free lunch so yeah. just kind of keep that in mind as you as you go as you go through that but the consequence could be a great full drum sound that that it's a fantastic phenomenal thing so they're yeah. also too i'll tell you another con aside, aside from all the mm -hmm. obvious technical things that you mentioned which are you nailed them that that's what it is latency and <clears throat> versus latency between buses mm -hmm. and also just overall latency in the processing path itself as Absolutely. it relates to the rest of the mix, blah, 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 blah. But they're also, you know, a lot of times all in live sound, all anyone wants to talk about is parallel drum processing. On a mixing level, be careful that you don't make this hulk of a drum mix that mm -hmm. no single input can ever compete against, you know, right. and then you've got the most badass drum mix ever and the rest of the mix just pales in comparison. <laughs> Right. And I and I've been extremely guilty of that. I've done that many, many, many times. Careful parallel, what you ask for. Yeah. Parallel processing is very, very, very powerful. It does what it's supposed to do. Yeah. So just remember everybody else has got to live with that thing too. And I, th I think you mentioned something key there a minute ago, which is that it doesn't always have to be on. I mean, like in, in my TV world, I've got, you know, these artists with these tracks. I'm gonna use the parallel bus to actually just kind of thump some of those, you know, reggaeton tracks. The next artist is gonna be a, the same playback track, but it's all strings and key patches and stuff. I don't need a parallel bus for that. Right. So it's a situation where in, even in the same song, you know, uh, there are bands, classic rock bands, where you might use a parallel bus compression for something on the drums in some parts of the song, but it doesn't have to be always on. It's a tool mm -hmm. that you're sculpting sound. Um, Puch, t talk a little bit about your drum bus scenario, because I know you go three levels deep before you get to instruments. So what, what is your path in there? <laughs> it's a little convoluted, but- It's a um... secret. <laughs> no, it's not. All right, um, so first off, let's just have the latency conversation right off the bat. You know, yeah. I'm, yes. uh, I'm quoted all over the internet of going, you know, don't get lost in latency. You know, I have um, some differing opinions than other people do about latency. My argument is that I don't sit there and worry about numbers. Like if something is three samples off, you know, 40 samples off, I don't be like, oh my God, it's 40 samples off. I need to do compensation unless it sounds bad. That's the first tool right. that we right. have is our ears. So. Um, the reason I say this is that you need to really pay attention when you're using a console like Digico that allows you to do bus to bus to bus because right. you can really screw yourself, you know, yeah. 
Um, yeah. You can get to a point where it's like, oh, wow, why is there comb filtering and you know all kinds of stuff. So um, is latency important? Yes. Don't get lost in the numbers. If it sounds good, it sounds good. But pay attention when you start doing what I'm about to tell you I do. Okay, so here you go. Um, if there's anything in a drum kit that is more than one microphone on the same input, kick drum, for example, where there's a kick in mic and a kick out mic, that gets summed into a mono bus mm -hmm. so that I have EQ control over the overall tone of that kick drum uh, and have a single handle of kick not two different faders that I'm messing with the relationships of between the in mic and the out mic, all right? right? So that ends up in a mono group. Snare drum, same thing, top and bottom, they end up in a mono group, right? Those mono groups, uh, along with toms, for instance, toms end up in their own stereo group. And the reason that I do that is I like some um, compression on the overall sound of the tom, so they all have snappiness, you know? I, mm -hmm. I take the attack, roll that off a little bit so it passes the transient pretty good, but then squashes. Uh, and I like that to be a singular tone for all the toms. So that's mm -hmm. a bus compression decision. So that happens, kick, snare, toms are now getting uh, forced over to my drum bus and my parallel drum bus right okay and those yep. and those end up um uh then finally ending up in a drums bus um uh, but here's where it gets a little wacky when it comes to symbols sometimes i make different decisions with symbols and hi-hat sometimes hi-hat and symbols end up all the way in that drum bus they don't mm -hmm. end up in the parallel or the drum, the pre-drum bus before everything gets summed together. Yeah, call it okay. the clean, call it the clean drum bus. Yes, the clean sure. drum bus. The final drum bus is there. Before mm -hmm. that is also a drum bus and a drum crush, right? So a lot of times I don't put the cymbals into that one. The cymbals end up all the way into the final bus to sure. be clean, not have any compression on them, etc. But you have to be careful because now you've gone through three layers of stuff with compression and all kinds of stuff yep. when when you're bypassing all of that and sending your symbols there. So just be careful of that. Yep. But so all of that ends up into a drum bus that is treated as the final product and and does have some bus compression on it as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's a three layer thing, all of them having stuff on them as they go. You know, there's and that's compression all... on that kick bus. There's compression on that snare bus. Yeah. Then there's compression on the main drum bus and the parallel comp compression. And then you know, it's a, it's a, it's. And mind you that you co you collapse all your non vocal stuff into an instrument bus. Uh, the same way that I do for the TV shows. You probably, I don't know if you do the same thing, Rabel, where you collapse all your music elements into an instrument's final bus before you add vocals uh oftentimes yeah i'll have a sometimes i will have instruments in one bus that and vocals in a separate bus that mm -hmm. then feed the mate the master bus sometimes yeah. it's more complicated than that that's my default that's your default Is, yeah and I that think has way but that has that has way more to do with of that that's done to keep the vocals to, that has more to do with vocal processing that has doesn't have really much to do with sure, which processing. is going to be the next thing is that uh, is the money channel you know you have these these mega artists like gaga that could subs full out you know your vocal processing uh you do a lot of that in the group in a special vocal group i know put and i talked about your vocal processing for bruce uh do you have a similar thing like with gaga for example where you have her going through a particular group and you process it, do a lot of the vocal processing for her vocal on that group nope no it um basically the what the, the reason for that group is twofold one it allows if it is a you know i, I i'm the one that, that, that always talks about you know if your PA is tuned right, you don't have to do mm. all this filtering of vocals for feedback suppression. Sure. 
and and you really don't in, in a lot of modern PAs today, unless the singer is just completely weak and has bad mm-hmm. flight technique. But 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 I want to have that ability in spades available to me if I need it. So one of the reasons I do a vocal group is so that if 1.8 is hot Mm -hmm. in the room, I apply it to that bus. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not burning a filter. Like those, those filters on the individual channels are for mixing purposes. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Whether Mm -hmm. it be cleanup or creative. And I mentioned that might extend to outboard plug-in as well that bus is we're doing surgery there that's damage control so i use so i and if i need to if i the lead vocal is really she's out front he's out front 1.8's taken out a lot inherently now my mix in that vocal area becomes softer i want it to be across the board for all Mm -hmm. vocals i don't want suddenly the backgrounds to have more i got you that so I'll do that. The other reason I'll have a second vocal bus, or excuse me, have a vocal bus separate from the instrument bus is if it is a situation where the vocals are very hot or there's just a lot of gain and I don't want the vocals subject to the bus compression that I have on the mix as a whole. Yeah, exactly. You know, yes. um, it, it is my wish and hope to always have them all reacting with mm-hmm. the bus compression. Cause I like that sound. Sure. But again, it's just like, you know, another common theme. It's an option. I build it in as such. It is my hope that there's no EQ on that vocal bus mm-hmm. and that both that vocal bus and that music bus or instrument, whatever you want to call it, sure. go to the master bus and all the yep. processing happens there, but it might not be, that might not be the way it plays out. So that yeah, that's that's why I do it. So like I was telling Butch, you know, the other day for some of the TV award shows, you know, vocals I always have to be on the front. So for me, it's at the very end, the very last where I have uh, you know a G bus on my music bus, and I have a different comp, different 901 on the vocal bus, and those are actually hotter to the final mix than yeah. the actual music because the TV director is always looking for the vocal; he's not looking for my kick drum. So right. I have to make sure that I don't have time to go looking for a fader. I want my vocals up there. So I think, you know, I remember Gaga coming to rehearsal at, at the Grammys with, and she is like full out. I mean, so you have to be ready to have that vocal, you know, out mm-hmm. there full, full on. And I assume you do the same thing, you know, with Bruce, you know, where you have it, you know, get, I get it every nuance of his, of his S's and words out there. Cause he's such a great enunciator. You know? Yeah, I mean, another reason that I separate instrument bus from vocal bus is because I do some of that MS uh, mm. compression in my instrument bus that yeah. is a direct out of a lead vocal mm. so that it makes space uh, in the center of your mix whenever that lead vocal happens. So, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll center something around 1.5 or whatever is the, is the you know, core frequency of that vocal. <laughs> Right. and have it compressed 3 dB in a relatively wide queue in my instrument bus when mm-hmm. the vocal happens. Um, if I didn't separate yeah. out the instrument bus, then I would be doing that in the overall mix bus, which doesn't yeah, work. You're you know. basically making space for the vocal to shine through, if you Correct. will. Correct, yeah. yeah. And, and it, you know, topic. it is, like I, we've been talking here, these are the little things, man. Just mm-hmm. these little, the fact... Uh, and they're little, yeah. but they're huge. Like literally, if I poked that MS thing in and out of a virtual playback session with yes. all of us on headphones, we'd all go, "Holy crap, that is like amazing," you know. And it's I so, it. but it's a little thing, but it's important, you know. Two topics as uh, so we kind of you know keep going towards the end here. Um, obviously, the consoles you're using allow you to customize your layers so that you can have digital control groups, audio buses, or any inputs in any order that you want. Uh, is that critical for you? Super critical. Yeah. Um, it's critical and it also will, I will make a decision based on ergonomics. Mm-hmm. And I did that the other day where I had, here's the scenario. So we're talking about busing and I hope I can say this succinctly and it makes sense. There was, we had our lead artist, Mm -hmm. right? She's her own deal. 
she goes to, she's assigned to a VCA. I realize it's one single fader going to a VCA that is six mm -hmm. inches to the left, but that's just what I do. <laughs> then I have the guitar player and the bass player. Right. And they are the backing vocalist, right? But then for this gig, they're bringing in two background vocalists. And what I mean by that is they're bringing in two badass women mm -hmm. that together are going to make this traditional yeah. badass background vocal sound. So the yeah. way I wanted to do it was those two girls, uh, they have to be two women, they, those, two, those two women went to a specific background bus. Mm -hmm. And I would usually do this with all of my vocals, but I decided with the guys, I didn't want them in that group because I wanted to treat them separately, but I wanted to treat the women as one sound, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. so they would all then, then, so what that meant though, and this got crazy because we were sending stems. You talk about having to keep it all straight in my head and <laughs> the routing, there was like yeah. a BGV group, a BGV stem. It was like, it was, it was kind of confusing to the BGV VCA mm -hmm. were the two and to your question, can't you just assign something straight? The two guys went to the BGV VCA, the group of the girls went to the VCA, mm -hmm. right? So these are different sources feeding the same, feeding the same VCA. Then we started adding guest vocalist. And next thing you know, it all, ex and I'd like to keep as many, uh, ideally all of my effects on that same vocal layer. Sure. It got to the point where we added so many vocalists <laughs> that my BGV group, something wouldn't fit anymore. So I ditched the BGV group, even though artistically, that's really what I wanted to do. But ergonomically, I didn't want to lose the Control. way things were laid out. I wanted it to be laid out sensibly and logically. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what? I know how to blend these girls. I'll be fine. Yeah. I think it's so. important for, for the audience to kind of realize that uh, we say you need a console that allows you to apply control groups into audio groups mm -hmm. and not just to inputs. And not only that, but the ability to actually kind of in your center section or however your layer gets gets mm -hmm. laid out, it's that you can put any fader anywhere and that you yeah. have to learn to mix on that kind of platform, figure out what actually works uh, best for you, yeah. what you need to have immediately accessible. I think we, we've and, talked about that. And, and something, to, something to keep in mind too you know different routing like i was a bummer i didn't like making that decision i really wanted to treat those two mm. women as a thing squash it eq them individually eq the thing like i always do but i also had to be careful where yeah i had specific effects for background vocals the two guys effects were sent from their individual channels the women were sent from the group so then when I lost the group, I had to remember, okay, I need to assign the effects because if I had sent the effects from the individuals for the girls, that would not have lined up with the resultant sound. And yeah. you see what I'm saying? And that's yeah, the absolutely. kind of stuff. It's not, it's not complex. It just gets to be a lot. It's like Pooch yeah. talking about with his routing. That's not complex. You just... Yep. Got to know where you are. Yeah. You know? And there is a topic uh, we're going to bypass it, but I, which you want to be aware of, which is sometimes when you're just controlling inputs into a subgroup, you might be mixing into compression. How those inputs going into subgroup with a compressor, you're increasing the gain reduction. Versus mm -hmm. if you have a sound that you crafted in your group, you're assigning the control group to that audio group so that Correct. that relationship stays consistent. So that's something right. that you want to go and dig into a little bit in the future. Um, oh, man, that's a that's a huge yeah, thing. You know, we could be thing. here for hours talking for hours. about it, but mixing into compression versus yeah. not mixing into compression is a whole yeah. It's something you hours. definitely want to experiment and kind of know sonically the difference of, of what is it. Um, one last topic before we take some Q&A here, which is there's like about 300 questions. Um, <laughs> you know, Perfect. this is obviously your master, uh, you know, master mix gets kind of sorted out to multiple matrices. But so which is fine. You guys use matrices to get out of your console and drive the, the PA, uh, whatever that is. Uh, the favorite topic of conversation is subs on an ox. Ah. Uh, <laughs> I know. I, I, I had to say that. Why um, are people so passionate about this? It's I, I have no idea. It's like I, politics at this I, point. I, I, I it don't is. Even, I'm just saying you guys are. Yeah, no, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I think that, um, first off, that I feel like mixing subs on an augs is, was a tool that we used for many, many years. 
in analog consoles with speaker technology not being great. Yeah. Um, and it, it was something that helped to clean up what you had going on um, with some lesser technology. So yeah. now with the technology that we have, I can't imagine why you would want to do that. But yeah. some people still do and they're passionate about it. Yeah. Fine. Like I say, you do yeah. you. And some of those technologies, so everybody knows what we're talking about, you know, back in the day, you your simple console might have a fixed 80 hertz, 12 dB per octave high pass. Now you have an adjustable high pass and sometimes adjustable slopes. So your control of those sub low frequencies, it's, it's has changed significantly. Yeah, um, I mean, so. you know, I think that in some ways, subs on an augs is like who gave the gun to the baby because <laughs> Right. You can really screw yourself over no. because what happens is you start making a floating crossover point with the frequency that right. you're sending down, um, you know, that that augs. Uh, so, um, I mean, if you know that, right, and you know what you're doing, you can get a result that is workable. But I think for the majority of engineers, it just doesn't make sense. You tune the system how it should be and align yeah. the system along with the sub information. Yeah. And then if I give you a left and a right and if a monoed source of that left and a right for a sub send, yeah. all, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Yes, you know? it's all um, done. And you know, the, the good point to the system tuning part, you know, you spend all this time, time aligning the subs to your mains. There is a, a phase gain relationship that we pre-established during system tuning. Uh, if you're not cautious when you're sending stuff through accents and you're, you know, going through all of these other paddle bus, you know, dynamics and everything else, you might be incurring latency on your mix bus that is not happening on your aux bus. And now all of a sudden you just offset the beautiful work you have between your subs and your mains. Not so only I, that, I, but I, I spend hours getting my mix compression, the final <laughs> source, yes. the final output of my console yes. has, has beautiful dynamic yes. you know, compression on it. And now if you make me go source my sub information from somewhere else, that sub information doesn't have any of that processing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah completely. Sense. Does that work for you also, uh, Brable? Yeah, it, it, to me, and again, <clears throat> honestly, yeah, I'm literally just going to parrot everything that the pooch just said. If it works for you, great. Or it, even to, to put a finer point on that thing, if you've been doing it this way mm -hmm. for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, then stick with it, you know? Yeah, but um, right. aside from all the technical headaches that it can bring about, pooch mentioned the you're, you're changing – the, the acoustical the you're changing the literal crossover point if i'm mm -hmm. sending a kick drum at zero right. to those subs you know the the crossover points are this if i'm sending the bass but the bass is only going negative six to that crossover point it's now down here look where that point is it's shifted so yep. you've got you've got those things moving and some could argue well you do that with eq too it's not the right. same when you're doing it with strict amplitude um there's a there's the other there's just the notion that like why it just makes it harder on yourself to keep track yeah. of yeah. what you're doing and again we go back to our thing about I really want nowadays with advanced as everything is, I want to know that my mix is going to translate from source to source to source to source. If I've got a floor tom that's negative 12 to the subs and then I send that mix to someone, is this what's the floor tom doing in that mix? You know, it's just just mix. Just yeah. mix. Yeah. Just mix. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That I would be that's my feeling. I would be very surprised, Raul, if we took a poll of the top 50 engineers that are mixing anything above, yeah. you know, 2,500 yeah. seats. Absolutely. If any one of those guys is mixing subs on and single ongs, I'd be very surprised. Me, yeah, me too. no, absolutely. You know, big shout out to actually to Brad Maddox, who's recuperating. I hope you're doing better. But yes, in our experience, bringing our demo rigs to many of these engineers, by far, most of them, most of you are just giving us a copy of the left and right. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's stereo, sometimes it's mono, uh, but it's the same left and right music mix, uh, period. No, no aux, uh, you know, they want to keep that balance to their 
they'll work it out with the system engineer as to how much or how little sub. Sometimes there'll be an extra handle, could be a separate matrix, could be whatever. So you go, okay, I can, I, I see where my subs are. I can, you know, bring yeah. that out. Shape but, the uh, system, not yeah. your, you know. Not yeah, your absolutely. All right. Uh, there's been a million questions that have already been answered, uh, but I think uh, that let me uh, grab a couple of things here. There was a question for you, Chris. Uh, you both make some Digicoin SSLs. Uh, obviously, it's all about the platform. I'm sure, sure you would mix on both, right? You still you still mix on multiple platforms, even though you mostly I do, as and I have and I have yeah. interest and I have interest in others as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I see value. It used to be where we were pretty handcuffed option wise. Now mm -hmm. there's, I had a literal dream about a Yamaha console. I mean, I yeah. like last night. I mean, it's just, I'm interested in a number, but I drift. Were you hugging to it? My, were you hugging yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are you? What do you do? Uh. Uh, we, had a, we had yeah. a question which doesn't really apply, but I'm kind of curious because your vocalist, you know, Bruce and Gaga or Bruno are such great vocalists. But they, this question is, you know, for vocalists who might not project uh, very much because, uh, you know, uh, oh, thank you for that is Brad Divens. I appreciate that. Uh, sorry, Brad. I was thinking of Brad Maddox, also another head engineer that doesn't use yeah, software. Yeah, Divens with the, the heart. Thing. Yeah, he, he's wow. recuperating. So much love and happy yeah, recuperation so to Senor Divens. Hope to see so you uh, pretty to the soon. Hospital. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, so anyway, the question on vocal mics, uh, they wanted to know if, you know, if you have a vocalist that it's got a, uh, because of their in the ears, they tend to pull away from the vocal mic. And, you know, what, what do you find? How do you approach that? Do you go talk to the to the artists, or is that you talk to the monitor engineer to kind of work with you on that? Or I don't think that's the case for you with Bruce or with Gaga, but uh, I, you ever I run into mix that? Alanis Morissette a lot. There you go. Holy cow! She holds right. the microphone by her waist. <laughs> yeah, well, tell me about it. Holy glasses. Um, yeah, I mean, all right. So in general, I have had conversations with monitor engineers in order to try to help both of us, you know? Mm. Like, listen, I know that you are being held to a certain standard by the pop star saying, hey, I want my vocal that loud in my mix, but any way slightly making changes to try to bring the overall volume of that pop star's vocal in their ears down mm -hmm. will force them to bring the microphone closer. It's gonna help you, it's gonna help me, um, you know, we've had those conversations and I, and honestly, I've had conversations, heated conversations after a show being like, dude, I know that you need to go there, but holy crap, you just made it where I couldn't hear the vocal at all because yeah. you forced her to do this, you know, right. um, right. she, you know, part, I, I love Alanis Morissette and she's awesome to me, but part of her thing is, is that she is so loud in her ears that she mm -hmm. literally tries to get away from herself, you know, right. Um, and so, you know, I mean, it, it is, it's a conversation. That's why monitor engineers and front of house engineers should be a team. There should never be right. me and them. It's never that for me. It's always, if yeah. I'm working with you for the first time as a monitor engineer, we're yeah. going to battle together, dude. You're in my foxhole. Let's go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this is actually the, no that phenomenon that Pooch mentioned is the norm yeah like mm -hmm. that's where we are now it was so funny i've joked before it was you know when ears came out everyone had their garwood radio stations or their future sonics belt packs and there were apex dominators on every single one of them the whole yeah. idea was we are going to save our hearing we're going to save our hearing it has gone the, uh, yes 80 degrees <laughs> yes the opposite way and i hear manufacturers with 14 diaphragms in their yes. ears yeah. Yeah. no yeah. limiting forget it you put on you you ask to listen to the artist pack at their volume you'll be blown away yeah it's on it's on stun. Time. yeah yeah it is the it is the norm it is not the yeah it's more the rule than it is the exception that that that, that is a phenomenon that happens as far as what you do like all things it depends yeah. And it's situation dependent. There are certain times where you just know if it's a young artist, uh, that then you, you know, who's approachable, that's awesome. Yeah. Then you have, you can, there's so many different ways you can go about it and explain it and not mm -hmm. be a jerk, but be, you know, this and that. If it's an established artist or someone who just doesn't care, 
you might even know, you know what, that's what this gig is. Yes. Like there's no, yep. Uh, yeah. There's just no winning on this one, you know, yeah. but don't, but touch on that again. If mm -hmm. you are an, a up and coming engineer working with an up and coming artist, don't let them get away with bad. No, habits. don't be the one to right. be like, Hey, uh, I know you don't know this, but let's talk about what's happening because mm -hmm. later on when they're, you know, like the, uh, you know, Billy Eilish, you explode into something that's huge overnight mm -hmm. and you're the, still the engineer. And now you're in arenas. You will thank yourself for fixing it. Yep. Mm. yep. Night needle. Yep. Cause this is um, the biggest yeah. problem anyone could have. That is the yeah. single biggest sure. problem anyone yeah. could have is what we're talking about. Bad here. microphone technique makes your day horrible. And mm -hmm. then, you know, that goes to the question on how do you depart a gig without burning bridges? And we'll talk about that another day. Um, <laughs> they, uh, somebody asked if you, either of you using uh, trigger drum sounds that are triggered by your actual drum set. I don't think either of you are. You're both are. Uh, I have one. I have one gig. Well, okay. If you're talking about. I think this sounds like the drum triggers drum samples is what it sounds like. Yeah, they're question. talking about drum samples to like yeah. either replace or augment. Correct. Because um, both of us, of course, have acts that have, you know, SPDs and pads and this right. and that. Right. Um, I do have one act that I work with where I there was a kick sample from the record that I mm -hmm. really liked that I asked that it be loaded at all times on the SPD. Okay. Um, and I made sure to, you know, if, you know, it was made sure I aligned it up correctly, which is a moving target. Cause if I change processing, then I have to redo the math and that's mm -hmm. where you can really it's like Pooch talking about getting lost in the weeds with the numbers. You just listen, you know? Right. So I've at most, that's the most I've ever done. Would I okay. like to do it? I would love to do it. I've had many conversations about it. I would love to be able to pull up different samples or yeah. ambient sounds or this and that, but as far as I've ever gone, it's just a kick sample. Yeah. And all your drum, obviously Maiden all real nico full on oh yeah no yeah. no triggered sounds anywhere um yeah it's all real drums i have had limited success like trying that like you mm -hmm. know i've had acts that you know guy shows up and he's like oh yeah i've got this trigger kick and snare it's awesome and the the snare and kick sound uh, by themselves are not great and the acoustic sound by themselves are not great and then trying to combine them gets really wacky um so i really focus on if i can i will ask and work towards getting great acoustic drum sounds mm -hmm. um and uh, eliminate the that yeah thing. awesome it's not great uh, we have a question, which is a yes. Can we have another system tuning session? You know what that's all about. So yes, the answer to that is yes. Uh, here's a good one. How can you tell where the mic pre sounds good? Ah. Practice makes perfect. I mean, that's just it, right? Okay, so this is a hard thing to teach people, right? You know, yeah. there's, there's um, you know, over gaining and under gaining. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and really, honestly, the best way to kind of learn that is in front of some sort of speaker, like a wedge would be great if you could experiment with having a console, like a little Mackie console next to you and learning what uh, over gaining and under gaining a mic pre sounds like mm -hmm. and how you can gain something so hot that it just it's uncontrollable, right? Like even though the fader is all the way at the bottom and it's almost off, it's almost muted the gain is so hot in the microphone preamplifier that mm -hmm. there's interaction with that speaker that is causing, you know, feedback to happen. Mm -hmm. And that is because your microphone preamp is, is linked to your acoustic to electric transduction, right? It right. is the thing that is, you know, exciting the, uh, the condenser microphone or, you know, whatever. So really, I, I say to people all the time, there are sweet spots in microphone preamplifiers. Mm -hmm. And even on as transparent as a microphone preamp is in a Digico, there is sweet spots in that microphone preamp. Don't just turn it up, be like, oh, it's at minus 20, and then mess around with the digital trim because yeah. there is a sound difference between it being undergained or overgained or at a really good sweet spot. And the only way to learn that is just by doing it, you know? Yeah. 
We had uh, one of the guests ask a little bit about uh, if you, you know which inputs do you still use the old uh, digital cards for. I know you're using some of the 32-bit. They just were curious as to what 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 are some of the inputs that you were still using the old uh, cards, which are not old, but yeah, <laughs> not old. Anything that I want to still be transparent. So, for instance, mm -hmm. keyboards. Like yeah. you know, if I had. 16 stereo stems of keyboards like you know with jay-z or whatever i don't necessarily want the front end of that to have any harmonic distortion in the front end part of that so um i'm trying to think what else i've used it recently um stuff like symbols you know i don't necessarily want a coloration on uh overheads um whatever but the thing i will uh, you know you guys should know this that there is a different latency time between a Digico regular card and a blue card. So mm -hmm. never plug base DI into a blue card and base mic into a regular card because the latency of those two arriving at you are going to be very different. Which, um, so yeah. just know that if you're going to use whatever instrument you're going to use in a regular card versus a blue card, plug it into just that card. If that makes sense. Great. Um, on the virtual sound check part of things, um, I think they were asking, you know, whether or not all your tracks are coming in dry with no dynamics. And I said, well, yeah, that's part of the exercise, right? You're just capturing, you know, you're recording the stuff at the preamp or whatever. Well, you might be, you might choose to grab it somewhere else, but in your case, you're probably grabbing it at the preamp and then going and playing it back through all your dynamics so you can make adjustments on mm -hmm. site, right? I Correct. think that, the, that that's, that's the, the clarification point. I think they were requiring. Yeah. Uh, good. Uh, let's see. Uh, virtual soundcheck. Do you work on earfuls and at what volume? Ah, which is talks about the question of protecting your hearing. You know, when you're working on virtual soundcheck on on headphones or earfuls, you know, what volume are you usually monitoring at? 100 dBA. That's pretty hot. Louder. <laughs> exactly. I mean, let's be honest, you know, sure. I, I mean, it's a pretty good volume. I mean, when I am working, I'm, I'm not as ridiculous as I've heard some other people, but I mean, it's a full volume. I don't think I've ever really measured it and certainly not, I haven't measured what I listen to in headphones, but, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's louder than you think. So when you're working on your on your you know production rehearsals, your near field monitors are cranking. They are, and especially, <laughs> and I'm pissing off the lighting guys. Yeah, yes, that's what's happening. And you do you have a similar situation, uh, Rabel? I think I saw you at some point in time with sixty three twenty eights, which are you know can get pretty loud in some of these circumstances. Yeah. <clears throat> which is part of the reason, I, one of many reasons I started using those. Um, you know what I do? I'll come up with. On headphones, I'll have like two spots. Mm -hmm. I'll have where I usually live, and then I'll have a quieter level. Um, if I'm doing near fields, I'll eventually memorize what the levels are. But it was funny, whenever I start a new gig, I get some white gaff, and I put it all over the console. And I have Sharpies and pens everywhere, and I just write notes everywhere. And one of the first notes I usually make at a new gig are a set of volume levels for my near fields yeah so like the gig the other day i remember it was negative 11 negative 18 and negative 32. like there it's like i don't because you got to remember when you get into hearing curves uh you know fletcher munson type stuff we will <laughs> perceive things different tonally yes. Yes. At, at their different levels so if you're sitting there just jacking with your level the whole time you're going to be making different decisions so you know, um, I typically, I love, I like mixing loud. I like doing that, but I also will have some other levels to reference to. And also you will find that a lot of times you can get lost. Sometimes I have trouble in headphones really judging impact. Mm -hmm. There's just something about headphones that throw me off, but I spend the majority of my time on tour in cans. In rehearsals, it's on near fields. But um, you can really tell a lot about balance and impact at a lower volume. It's just not nearly as fun. And it doesn't replicate what we do. So yeah, sure. I, use it, I use it as a tool and as like a break for myself, but mm -hmm. I don't hang out there. It's just a reference point. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't mix loud all the time. I, you know, just like Chris, I'll do spot checking of yeah. turning it way down, hearing what my balance is, and yeah. then turning way back up. Uh, but for the majority of mine, I'm it's pretty loud. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah well, I'll get it, cans. I'll get cooking in cans and take them off and be just like, what am I doing what? myself? <laughs> all, like That's all the time. Loud. Yeah. You know? Uh, one of our guests wanted us to know if you had an external process server before your PA. I think you have a lake on one of your racks or both of you use lakes before going to your PA du jour. I do. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm always carry. Uh, there's always the final console to a lake is always mm -hmm. my thing because right. I want that control when I go to a festival, for instance. Sure. That lake is on a, you know, a wireless pad. Yeah. So I can walk out and check out a speaker system that I'm not familiar with and do yeah. some EQ or help stuff. you custom create your target curve or whatever. Yeah. I, I don't and, know you, you know, their, yeah. their, uh, EQ is so, uh, you know, phase uh, yeah. coherent. Uh, right. it's, a, it's a great little tool. I have the only one, I always have a lake. Usually lake is in front of whatever because mm -hmm. of familiarity and speed. Yeah. Um, I will always have a lake with me for when we go to festivals mm -hmm. or if I'm picking up PA somewhere. But I will say this, L Acoustics, um, uh, whatever sound manager, whatever theirs is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is the only one that I've been able to say, I don't need anything else in front of it. That it was quick enough and intuitive enough to mm -hmm. just have that and to mm -hmm. take the lakes out of the picture. Good. Um, so you were driving directly from the console uh, right. into whatever distribution structure. Right. Yet I still there. had a lake for left, right, subfill in the rack for when mm -hmm. we went to festivals yep. or whatever it might be. And speaking of that, one of the uh, guests wanted to know if you have considered doing any outboard summing. In your case, you're doing all of your bus to bus summing. Everything is digital. I know some people with other consoles have actually gone out on groups and done the analog summing and come back into the console for the final mix bus uh mm -hmm. ever considered doing any kind of analog summing mm -hmm. i Anomaly? did that for the jay-z 444 tour um mm -hmm. uh and uh the end result was was good um but in the end i had to ask myself could i've gotten there without doing the analog summing and yeah. and is it worth it to creating yeah. so many breakage points yeah. points <laughs> because of literally i had you know i had another stage rack at front of house that was going in and out of this you know neve unit um basically as a, a analog summing unit then coming back to the console you know um and i just was like is it really that much better yeah yeah, I'd yeah absolutely. It, i would a b it and go yeah it's yeah. better but is it really that much better for all of the the possible pitfalls that I could be creating here. Yeah. Um, so I I kind of have shied away from it, but I know there are major major guys out there that swear by it and yeah. say that that is the only reason they're getting what they're getting. And cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Try it yeah. out. All right. And um, there were several questions on subs on an ox. We think we uh, put that to bed. Uh, I think between <laughs> it's never put to bed. It's not going to bed. <laughs> there is no consensus. Um, but it's uh, just go back. And then regarding the roles that you play with your system engineer, I encourage you to go back and listen to the webinar that we did uh, previously with uh, Pooch and Cookie on the relationship between the front house engineer and the system engineer. So Shout I will out to Chris Hoff. <laughs> indeed. Um, and with that, I would love to bring back Michael uh, to put us away. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around for, for this lovely long session. Yeah, uh, thanks for uh, hanging out, guys. We will definitely send the remaining questions to both of our guests. Um, I would like to remind you that tomorrow we have a great session on room acoustics with Sam Burkow. And next week, uh, we'll be hosting uh, Claudia Engelhardt, front house engineer for the one and only uh, Bill Frisell, the iconic uh, jazz musician. And uh, so please join us for that. Again, I cannot uh, thank you guys enough for uh, coming and, and being part of our series. Uh, Raybel, it's been a great, great honor having you on board, and I hope it's not the last time. Uh, oh, thanks for which, having me. Man, it's been a great time. Putsch, uh, my pal, my buddy, 20 years on the go. Yeah, let's uh, let's keep it going 20 more and uh, stay healthy, you all. Stay warm and uh, hope to see you on the next one. Thank you, everybody, from uh, Dial Again. Michael? Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, to pick up where Raul left off there, um, 
Chris, Pooch, Raul, thank you guys for just an awesome, awesome session. Thank you for the time. This has been incredible. Audience, thank you guys for joining and for all the engagement. Um, it's just been an absolutely awesome session. Uh, the recorded version uh, of this session will be available here in the next few days. So definitely be on the lookout for that on our Harmon training portal or on our YouTube channel as well. And as Raul mentioned, we got awesome sessions upcoming tomorrow, next week, and, uh, and moving forward. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Thanks again, everybody, to our presenters, to our audience, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.